the only one drinking out of a bottle today. <laughs> for now. Just like a baby. For now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's two episodes in a row where I didn't spill a drop. Nice. Mike, you're there. I know, arrived. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers, boys. Cheers. It's going to be a great episode. Dude, that looks tasty, Paul. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, real tasty. Love it. Nice. So, what are you drinking there, Paul? Well, well, guys, uh, beans, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning here in, uh, on the West Coast. <laughs> I went with a, uh, this here is a, a great notion, unbalanced breakfast. Very uh, nothing, like, <laughs> nothing like a little beer for breakfast. Uh, is that what you drink every here? morning? Yeah, it gets the blood pumping, loosens things up. You know, I uh, have tank. that with a little coffee chaser. <laughs> yeah <laughs> little little push me pull me uh so this is a tart ale it's with blueberry uh maple syrup and coffee and uh that maple syrup's coming through strong which is uh uh good to good to hear um it's 6.5 alcohol and uh it's really um every time they release this at great notion i try to get up there and at least get a four pack because uh it's it's good stuff and uh how often do they release it uh usually what do you think eric a couple times a year yeah once or twice it's becoming more of a normal repeating one yeah you nice you boys, you boys want some next time yeah next time grab me uh grab me a set I'd like it's okay. solid yeah it's, uh, it's way better uh, way better than you think it would be yeah it's good it's yeah, good they're not it's shy so with those maple the maple notes in there <sighs> Yeah. yeah. Yep. You've had it, Jimmy? No, just it seems like anything coming from from there, it's from great the notion. Ma- yeah. The maple is pretty forward, which is fine. Yep. But... <clears throat> yeah. So I decided to uh, go with a smoothie. Never hurts to have a little bit of fruit in the morning, you know. Makes me feel uh, less guilty. My my daughter was down here when I was setting up, and she was like, "Are you going to start drinking this early in the morning?" And I was like, <laughs> "It's brews and views." I, yeah. there's nothing i can do you know i don't have a choice out of your control <laughs> charge yeah, it exactly. to the game so this is a hydro smoothie series from mortalis and this one has mango strawberry peach granola and coconut seven percent so you know it's like a little fruit bowl with some granola it's like what most people have in the morning so yeah i'm not the rails quite yet <laughs> I think Excellent. your family's planning an intervention, though, for after. <laughs> Trying to book all those photographers from China, you know, figured yeah. get it there a little earlier in the day. You know, it's all right. about work. <laughs> it's all about work. <laughs> so I'm drinking so, the... Oh, go ahead, Jimmy. You go first, because um, i, I got to so, read this a little bit more. Yeah, so I, I grabbed uh, um, the last can I have oh, of these, um, which is a collaboration beer, three times three with uh, from Brujos, but it's an Omnipolo um, collaboration. So we'll shout that's, out to Sw- That's the best beer I've ever had in all my life. The one you're holding in your hands. Oh, this one really? Nice. That's, you got to try that one, Hans? Uh, you can't find it here anymore. Uh, right. Yeah, because this was, this was from it's a It's just a single ago. batch. Yeah, it's from October. It's that really was good. That was a great so that's beer. the version that Brujos made with the recipe. And so then you probably had the one that Omnipolo made over there with the same recipe. So it, it might have been slightly different. But um, yeah, Hans told me about Omnipolo a, a long time ago. So I know he knows about that. It's like 10 nice. point, what is it? 10 point. Yeah, it's a triple IPA. Yeah, 10.2 on this one. Um, so it's uh, Omnipolo and Monkish and North Park and Troon and other half and Trillium and Brujos. So, All of them? Jesus. Yeah, it's, yeah it's I, really I was big. expecting like a, a soup, but it's it's really tight. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's just a great, it's a great beer. Sweet. It's he- held up really nicely too. All right, so I am drinking uh swamp what is it swamp stacks or snacks swamp stacks right uh which is an imperial 
uh, stout from uh, collaboration between Parrish uh, Brewing out of uh, New Orleans and Great Notion out of Portland, uh, the brewery that Paul's drinking a beer from today. Um, so description on this one, Imperial Stout aged 22 months in Blanton's barrels. So I didn't realize when I bought this that it was that it was Blanton's barrels. So Blanton's is a uh, bourbon, uh, one of the higher end bourbons out there. Um, anyway, aged 22 months in those barrels, coconut, maple, marshmallow, and graham cracker. And uh, Jimmy, I think to your point about Great Notion going kind of heavy on the maple, it's definitely heavy, heavy on the maple. That's probably the most uh, pronounced uh, flavor that I'm getting out of this is the maple. Um, nice. Coconut probably being the least, but it's it's solid, really well balanced. Not It's 13%, so uh, pretty high ABV, but not not very boozy at all. So we'll let yeah, it warm for up stouts, a after coconut, <clears throat> I always love like a good maple stout. When the maple is really prominent, it works super well, super nice to drink. Yep. Yeah, so you sure guys each have a bottle of this coming to you. Jimmy got his yesterday, <laughs> so you'll you'll get a chance to drive. And you got one for Christmas too, didn't you, Paul? Yeah, I got one in the fridge. Yeah, nice. I'm, I'm really stoked to try it. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. It's probably New York maple too, none of that Vermont BS. Yeah, yeah, the fake stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hans, what did you find over across the pond to drink tonight? Uh, it's also Omnipolo. It's a co cooperation uh, collaboration with uh, Troon, and it's called uh, another IPA. Uh, it's a triple IPA. And uh, super fruity, um, extremely well balanced, 9.6%. Uh, uh, lovely. I, I think it's just as good as the one uh, that was three times three, what it was called. Yeah, yeah. three times three. Yeah. yeah it's hallelujah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great collab. Yeah, you Heck get yeah. the color film first sip and everything turns into color. Man, it looks fantastic. It does. Uh, Man, I'd love to try that. The good thing about this uh, is that West Coast style, right? Uh, or East Coast style. East Coast, East Coast style. Yeah. Hazy. And look like you you are drinking orange juice, so you don't shame your, uh, make a fool out of yourself drinking it. <laughs> yeah, if you get pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Drinking one of these uh, similar... Uh, beers uh, last summer in my summer house and uh, a friend of mine came by and he, he never drinks and he, he don't like people who are drinking and I was drinking this and he, he thought I was drinking orange. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cleverly disguised. Incognito. Yeah. Easy mistake to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was telling Hans how, uh, how big of a deal Truon is over here and how it's like impossible to get anything from them because it just sells out with like within like an hour and they're in New Jersey. So yeah, that's a really awesome one. I'm envious of that one for sure. I, I just ordered uh, six more of these. Now they were only um, uh, about $6.50 a, a can. So it's nice. That's the same can. as how they are over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought they would have been more expensive in Sweden. No, not really. Yeah. So I know, I know. Yeah. Is that a pretty big brewery over there, uh, Hans? Nepolo is uh, quite a big brewery in uh, the north part, northern part of Stockholm, in Sundbybergen. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I think it's the number one brewery in Sweden, actually, in terms of quality and in the pale ales. Is that is that very far from where you're located? Can you drive up there? Or do you have to have it sent down to you? It's like so, uh, five, six seven kilometers, not more than that. Oh, okay. Quite nice. Oh, it's real close. Fifteen minutes so far. Nice. But I, you know, we have a monopoly here, so unfortunately, I can't buy the, uh, directly from the source. I have to go through the Swedish monopoly and buy it there. Yeah, distribution. But that's, that's okay. It works. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks for coming on, Hans. I've been wanting to have you on for a while because I know you're a big beer fan because we've been talking about beer and sharing beers with each other on Instagram for years now. And uh, But I know you also, so you like IPAs, and then you also like wine, don't you? Aren't you? Yeah, I'm actually more of a wine geek than a beer geek. But uh, in recent years, I've, I've uh, got to, to uh, enjoy uh in the pale ales, I think they are the bless a blessing. Uh, really, I don't like uh, lager style of beer. I think it's way too malty for my taste. You know, 
I, I prefer these. I think they are uh, as close as you can get to wine, you know, when, when you have, especially when you get them like uh, eight, nine, ten percent. So you have the power behind it. much cooler beer than the five percent. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, New Year's Eve is coming up. Do you have any plans? Are there, are there any kind of like Swedish traditions for New Year's Eve or? Getting drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tradition or that's just you? There you go. <laughs> yeah, we've done as we can and we rarely fail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we might have, um, actually to an American guy and his wife tomorrow, more, uh, tomorrow evening and uh, he's into Spanish wines and we, we drink a hell of a lot there. Nice. Yeah, that, yeah. Very Maybe nice. two bottles of wine per per scot per guy per head. Yeah, sort of ish. Wow. Maybe maybe two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. So I need to clear the air here. Uh, a few episodes ago, we were talking about food, and Jimmy said that Swedish food apparently sucks. <laughs> like it's the worst. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Meatballs, or Ikea. Meatballs. That's what I said. Well, to his credit, Jimmy is like of Swedish descent, right? Yeah, I'm about one third Swedish. Yeah. So I have a cousin who actually lives in Stockholm as well. So it's, yeah. uh, I don't know if that, if that helps. <laughs> yeah. But every, uh, every Christmas Eve for, for years, that's what my mom would make would be uh, um, like Swedish meatballs. And that's about it. That's not good. We call this Prince sausages, the small sausages. And uh, we have something called Johnson's Temptation, which is like a gratin of uh, anchovies and uh, potatoes and cream. It's very special, but fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you like that? And ham and um, herring, um, you know, um, marinated herring and all kinds. Um, yeah, quite quite nice actually but uh, actually swedish food is very much today mixed up with uh, food from anywhere in the world so um, yeah italian um asian food french food whatever and um also of course swedish they uh, swedish uh, chefs have won quite a lot of uh, titles uh, in the last years you know in the, what you call book cool store or whatever you know like a world championship for chefs so there is quite a lot of high restaurants around expensive ones of course but i rarely go there nice yeah well, i'm not surprised jimmy's usually wrong about stuff so i just wanted to <laughs> just need to make sure he's keeping his streak of being wrong up <laughs> So uh, how short are the days right now that it's winter over in Sweden? It's no days at all. Today was no day at all. It was just really? woke. Because cloudy? Yeah, cloudy, overcast, very dark. You know, it's like, uh, you know, in, in photography terms, in EV terms, you know, exposure value, you know that? It's probably yeah. EV, EV is six. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. About... Uh, Eight stops under. <laughs> yeah. White point is like 100. Yeah, it's like 102. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's our language. Yeah. yeah. How many hours of sunlight do you have right now each day? Um, we have, if, if the sun is up, we have a sunrise uh, roughly at nine and then sunset around three. So... Okay. Hmm. When the sun is, uh, you know, I'm on only I'm at the 59th parallel Stockholm, so it's not very high up. Okay. Well, up in the north, they they are under the uh, polar. I mean, they're under the horizon, so they have the Arctic night now. Up in Kiruna in the north, so they, the sun returns uh, around 20th of uh, January, I think. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah, two months without sun, just wow. uh, twilight. Just twilight. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I wouldn't, I couldn't live there. Yeah. Okay. 
No, I think good. I would. I would have a harder time in the summer when it's like, yeah, uh, right out at like eleven thirty at night. I think that would mess me up more than the dark. And all the mosquitoes. Holy shit! Yeah. It's uh... <laughs> <laughs> up no up north. Yeah, well, you know, in these national parks up there, you know, in the mountains, it would be heaven if it wouldn't be for the uh, mosquitoes. You know, they you lose a half a liter of blood when you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you just came out with a new book recently aqua yeah i think we all have a copy oh you do yeah 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 you have yeah. the one with mm -hmm. the sleeve yeah you're good uh, okay i was wondering if they all came with a slip case or if i got a special one because oh. we're special friends special friends <laughs> the, the guys who write the four words <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, lovely writing very nice of you i appreciate it. the opportunity it is an honor for me thanks um yeah it's a great so, book uh, i enjoyed going through it yeah yeah it's super nice uh so hans and i, I have, have done in order. several critique groups together uh actually jimmy was in one of those critique groups do you remember him hans yeah, i think it was last I year yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Word? Yeah. <laughs> You're not fly. Like, uh, say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so after one of those critique groups, Hans and I were just talking, and he's telling me that he's working on a new book, and I asked him like, "Who's writing the forward for it?" And uh, he was like, "I haven't picked anybody yet." And I was thinking like, "Oh, you should ask like Sebastião Salgado or like Art Wolf or like." I feel like Hans could ask like anybody, any of the legends. And then he was just like, well, do you want to write it? And at first I was like, <laughs> I, I, I was like shocked. So I, I said, no. Cause I was like me, like, I don't deserve to do that. Like that, who am I to write a forward for one of your books? And so I actually like turned him down. And then like the day, the next day I was like, oh, I'm so stupid. Like they would be like a huge honor. Like it's it's so cool of him to ask me and I kind of like turned him down. So I was like, all right, well, if, if you want me to do it, like he asked me, I wasn't, I, I never thought, you know, that I should do anything, but uh, yeah, I ended up doing it. And it's awesome to be a part of one of your books, especially one that is so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And, and your writing was just fantastic. Thanks a lot. You're too kind. It's, that's really great. I, I just got that book. Uh, a couple of days ago, Hans, as well as one of your others. And uh, I just opened the package of the one that Eric's holding uh, this morning. So I was having my coffee. I take the I take the package off of it and I open it up and uh, Eric's Eric's four words right there. I'm like, what? And then I just worked my way through the book. Absolutely amazing. Really beautiful photos. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. There's always uh pictures you regret and uh, when you have it in your head. that's life it's just to move on, move, move on. yeah it, it takes so long to make a book by the time it comes out a lot of times you can be tired of the work already because you've looked at it like scrutinized it and make sure everything's perfect over and over again and then also like if it comes like like this book that i just produced took like a year to make so in that year that i've like like after making all the images and actually making the design for the book, it took a year to like get it produced and everything pretty much. So within that year, I've made so many new photographs. I'm like, oh, I wish I could swap some of them out with like my brand new stuff that I really love. But it's just never going to be like up to date with what you're currently doing. It's just the nature of it. No, yeah. That's a good and, point. And the, also the way that uh, the most recent images are the ones to you have a shorter perspective on those and you think they might be better than the old ones but as time goes um maybe they are not as good as the old ones you never know you know right and i have a tendency to put in new stuff all the time until the day of the when they start to press but um, i don't know if it has the good decisions so there are pictures yeah, not, are not all of it ages super well It'll kind of no. die kind of yeah fast yeah. how many yeah, books got... have you made so far it's 11 books now yeah okay mm. and uh so what year did you put out your first book 
95, yeah. Wow, I was five years old. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the subject of that one? Uh, water, again. It was... Uh, okay. Uh, the title was And the Sea Never Rests. It was... Uh, I had a fantastic writer. His name was Rolf Edberg. He used to work for United Nations uh, as the Swedish, uh, what do you say? Um, yeah, what do you call them? Re representative sitting in the uh, UN. And then he became a, like a governor in Sweden uh, in his older days. And uh, he started to write books. And uh, he was a fantastic writer. He could, could write about uh, nature and science in a way that he, he started to cry. You know, he was like a poet, uh, incredible guy. But he was very old. He was 82 when he wrote that book for me. And uh, he, he wrote another book in uh, eight, 98 uh, about trees. And um, then he died. He... he um, he wrote the last chapter in the Canary Islands, and uh, he had a hard time writing because it was old and uh, it was working slowly. And uh, he called his uh, daughter and said, "Finally, I have uh, finished the books today. Uh, uh, I finally finished the book today and uh, last chapter, and uh, I'll go into the sauna and relax now." And he died in the sauna. Can you believe that? Wow! He did what he had to do, and then he just. Pull the plug out, more or less. Wow! Passed away in, in the sauna. Yeah, hmm. incredible. Man. That's crazy. I'll have to check out some of his books, and that sounds really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I can find a, a English version of, of the first book, I might have some. I'll send it over to you if I find one. So uh, you were like a rifleman before a photographer. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Uh, I started shooting when I was twelve, and I stopped when I was uh, thirty-three because of my back. Uh, I had back problems, so I had to give it up. And uh, I was shooting in the Swedish national team, uh, national team between uh, seventy-three and um, eight, eighty-eight. So fifteen years. Yeah, and you were in the Olympics like in 95, you said, I think, in LA or something? 84, Los Angeles, yeah. 84, yeah. Wow, that's great. Cool. And you got a, what medal did you get? Didn't you get a, in a medal? Not, not really, but number six. I was number six. That's not too bad. But That's pretty amazing, out of the world. That's fantastic. You know? Yeah. But I, I, the thing was that I screwed up. I, I was in the lead after half the match. After 30 shots, I had 30 tens. 30 bullseyes and then the wind started to blow from the left and uh, it started to get complicated you know and uh, I, instead of yeah I was really focused you know and the, then I shot the nine and then I went from this to this you know I, uh, I lost you know I lost it the flow. Up. yeah so I and that, up. that was skiing and shooting right no just shooting yeah oh, okay didn't you do like skiing? I forget what they call that, but like where you have to oh, ski to the on. target and shoot. Yeah. Uh -huh. My father was a good skier, but I wasn't. No. Okay. <laughs> I was a horrible skier. Yeah. I, yeah. I was wondering if you were like in the military or anything like that, like how you got into shooting. No, not at all. I hate the military. <laughs> uh, well, don't say that around Mikey, but. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's not in the military uh, anymore. I I think it's very important these days that you have a, an army. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm taking that back because uh, without an army, uh, Europe would be under Mr. Putin now. So mm -hmm. um, let's hope hope that that war will sort out on the good way uh, on the good side. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's cool. So. Um... <clears throat> You've been doing photography for like 40 years then. You found I, I all of these. Uh -huh. I wasn't really born with a camera in my hand. I, you know, I, as I <laughs> said, I was in the shooting and um, uh, it wasn't until I was starting my studies. I, I started to become an engineer, a mechanical engineer. And uh, in uh, 1981, uh, I all of a sudden became interested in photography. And from nowhere, actually, I, I was painting uh, 
um, a lot when I was younger, oil and aquarelle, what they call watercolors, that kind of stuff. But I, I, I reached a point where I didn't develop. And uh, all of a sudden, I, for some reason, became interested in photography and started to buy photo magazines and uh, uh, looking into photo books. And uh, uh, in February 1981, uh, we went to America to Stanford University with my class from university. And uh, I bought my first camera in San Francisco, uh, mm -hmm. uh, RTS uh, with three lenses, size lenses. And I took my first rolls of film in Yosemite. Can you believe that? So <laughs> I had no wow. choice. I had to become a landscape photographer, you know? Yeah, you are locked in at that point. Yeah. And the funny thing was that I took 21 rolls of film and uh, everybody thought I was a complete idiot shooting that much. But I thought it was a fantastic four corners on on what you have in front of you and, and, and make your own, uh, how to say, subtraction. Everything is there, but you subtract and you include what you think is necessary. And I think that's still what, what it's all about, you know, uh, putting your four individual corners. Yeah, I uh, I know you're a big fan of looking at photography and stuff because of the critique groups we've done. Like you've always been really interested in, in the photos that we've reviewed together. Um, so that was going to be my question. Like before the internet, finding photography must have been much harder. Uh, I, when I became a photographer like 10, 11 years ago, you know, we had social media. The internet is really easy to find photos and now it's become even easier we're just like inundated with it but back then it was just like photography books or like uh who were some of the early influences i know you like elliot porter a lot so you probably were getting his books and yeah of course and and david munch i think uh yeah he's awesome the the base of uh, my photography and i think many photographers today is the way he was composing his images with uh, huge foregrounds and great depth of field and using wide angle lenses and uh, get a lot of volume in the frames. You know, I think uh, he has had a lot, lot of influence on my photography, uh, especially in the, in the first year. And of course, I, Elliot. I just learned a couple of days ago, reading this book about the history of Capitol Reef. Um, it's called uh, The Capitol Reef Reader by uh, Stephen Tremble. But David Munch's dad, Joseph Munch, I think it was his name. He was a professional photographer too. It's pretty crazy, the legacy. Because now David's son, Mark, is also a professional photographer. Yeah, three generations of great photographers, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you're getting Elliot Porter's books, you're saying? Yeah, of course. I, um, I don't know, maybe five, six books. Uh, also, the first one he did in, uh, was it the first? Maybe not, but it was the place no one knew. That's one of the first, yeah, with David Brower. I have a copy of that. I think it was printed in 68, maybe. I think they, they built the, or was it the second edition, second print run? I don't know. They they built the dam, uh, Blank Canyon Dam in 63, I think. And they flooded the whole, whole uh, Glen Canyon. And you can imagine what was there and what everything was put under water yeah there was no uh debate either it was just just happened it's because originally they wanted to dam a different part of the colorado which went through dinosaur national <laughs> monument which was already a monument at that time yeah, yeah this was like 1964 when they were doing the plans for this yeah. and just because it was a monument even though like nobody had really been to dinosaur national monument it wasn't like a super famous place they were like there's no way you're gonna dam one of our national parks like just because of the title but then they're like okay and they had this like other place in their pocket which was glen canyon which nobody had ever heard of it had no kind of designation and so yeah there was just nobody knew what it was or what they would lose and so david brower agreed to have that damned instead and he still regrets it to this day he says it's like the biggest loss for an environmental history and like the biggest mistake he's ever made and like he'll never forgive himself for it but yeah, that's that was like a super sneaky plan that they had because that's re that's like what they wanted to dam originally. But they're like, let's propose somewhere that they'll obviously say no to and then compromise on yeah. a different place, which is what they right. wanted all along. And they, they totally it totally worked out for them. 
unfortunately. And what, what's the current uh, situation? The the power plant doesn't work because all the silt, or what is it? Uh, I've heard that it's it's it kind of clogged with silt. Is is that the truth? I haven't heard that. The main things I've heard is the water level is getting so low now um, because of the drought. Like a lot of Glen Canyon is exposed again. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's not how it was, or probably won't be until they unless they get rid of the dam. But um. Yeah, I've just heard like the water level is really low and it's not as uh, it's not as productive as it was, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Fantastic area though, uh, all, all that area around there. What, yeah, all the surrounding stuff like that I go to frequently just gives you an idea of what Glen Canyon probably looked like, which is just much more extensive much more concentrated you know has tons of little side canyons and stuff and right. even uh john wesley powell said it was the most remarkable part of his journey when he mm. rafted the green river and then the colorado river even more so than the grand canyon so wow. that's that's pretty disturbing to hear yeah <clears throat> so did well, Elliot porter go in to document that before it was flooded yeah yeah oh wow i didn't realize yeah, that because it was like existed. a it was like a four year period. It's a really difficult book to get. But yeah, the plan was proposed like in 1964, if I'm not mistaken. And then it was damned like in 1968. And so I wrote about it in conversations with nature, uh, like the dates are in there and stuff in the canyon section. But um, yeah, so he went in to photograph it. And that's a really great book too. the photography is really cool. Yeah. The 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 colors are a bit weird you know because you can imagine what kind of material it's old he, printing yeah yeah and uh, he was probably having bad you know he was shooting uh, on chromes i think um ectochrome or a chrome sheet film right was it probably what, did they make uh four by five film for color chrome i don't know maybe not ectochrome i think but you know the colors are pretty weird but um Still, you can see uh, his way of composing and uh, interpreting what he had around him. We're very much focused on the small thing, on, on the intimate stuff, which I really like. I wish they would reproduce a lot of Elliot Porter's books with like the modern printing techniques now, and they could color correct stuff, and I think it would look amazing. There was uh, uh, so something going on with um, his name. Uh, um, American photographer, Robert Glenn Ketchum. Uh, I think he was on, uh, involved in a project uh, doing something with, with Porter's images. Uh, I don't know if, if, it, if it happened or not, but that was maybe 10 years ago, but yeah, <laughs> probably happened there. So being like off in Sweden, super far away from the US, like how are you ordering these books without websites and stuff? How are you even hearing about them? Or... Uh, I thought I honestly, yeah. honestly I, I am not buying very many books now because I, my bookshelf is over full and I have no space for them. So that's a boring, uh, boring situation, terrible situation, but I just can't find space for, for a new book. So I'm, I'm not like before I was buying every new book that came out. I'm very selective. I maybe buy five books per year, not more than that. <laughs> but before I bought maybe uh, 20, you know, mm -hmm. I was uh, sucking everything in. And when I went to America, which have, uh, that happened quite a few times, I, I used to come home with 10 books, you know, that I couldn't find. Okay. So you just like go to a bookstore, grab whatever looked good, and take it home. Uh, no, sure. hmm. Nice. So, Mike, you have a copy of it there? I do. Yeah, they're they're Courtesy pretty hard to find. They're the... really pricey. Was well, that the paperback? Yeah. yeah, the paperback version of it. Um, At uh, least it's not. Carly Minnick a... gave it to me actually. Oh, wow. That's a great gift. Yeah. Um, didn't say quite where she got it from, but uh, she, I mean, she's obviously, she lives in that area and she writes a lot about that area and that's kind of central to her, her photography and her art. So um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, 
I thought I actually had it upstairs in my house and I was just thinking about it. I was just right outside. So that's why I ran and grabbed it real quick. Yeah, I was able oh, to nice. find the abridged version for like 60 bucks. But um, mm-hmm. I want to get the full version eventually. But they're like 350 bucks. Like, I haven't found anything lower than that. Yeah, this uh, one was used. Nature's Chaos is another fantastic book by him. Yeah, I have that, that one. That's really, really nice. Yeah. And he also made a Grand Canyon book. Uh, which is really nice. Yeah. A more, I don't know the titles, but yeah. Pioneer. And very few uh, understood what he was doing, appreciated what he was doing. I heard he had a presentation for National Geographic. Everyone was just shaking their heads. They didn't understand his his language. So his, they want to have sunsets and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, the intellectual stuff of poetry, you know. Didn't work. Well, he was a pioneer of color photography too, because Ansel Adams and all of them thought color photography is just like a gimmick. They thought, you know, only black and white photography should be taken seriously, and he totally like pushed that and uh, used color intentionally in a way that, like, um, yeah, he became like known for for making color work like accepted as artistic and not just a gimmick. Hmm. So I appreciate that because I love color he, photography. He was like 84 or 85. He died at the age of 89 or 90. He uh, died um, about a, like November 3rd, 1990, I think. Yeah, 1990, November. Like a week yeah. after I was born. That's yeah. how I know that. And he went to Antarctica. He was more than 70, 74, 70, and Iceland a couple of times in the early 70s. Yeah, mm-hmm. and China, and he did his Grand Canyon trip when he was sixty-nine, and uh, you know he educated himself to become a doctor, a medical doctor, and he never practiced that uh, only once, and that was when he did his uh, uh, boat trip through Grand Canyon, and uh, one of the guys in the boat got injured; he got a big uh, cut in the head, and he stitched him up, up. and that. Mm-hmm. I may practice his skills for medical school. <laughs> hmm. Then it was 69, yeah. So I have, I'm 68 now. So next year, maybe I'll do a Grand Canyon. Book. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Good you have some, some great photographs to share with us. So we'll start looking at those. Yeah. That's a cool one, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we know, we all know, Alex. I've been drooling over this uh, ever <clears throat> since I saw it the first time. I think it's just absolutely crazy. It's just phenomenal shot. Uh, first, w- what kind of a flower looked like? It's amazing, and mm-hmm. the way it's composed and the technically and and artistically how he uh, he made this absolutely perfect con- composition. I've seen other photographers trying to photograph this flower, but no one ever has seen as Alex did it. That's a home run. That's a really home run. I, I could almost sacrifice all my photography for this one. <laughs> wow, that's a huge compliment. Uh, this is a hallelujah shot, really. Yeah, that's a beautiful image. I, I remember um, when we had Sarah on for the first time and she talked about the experience of uh, her, Alex, and Ron hiking and, and and coming on to this uh image and yeah it's it's really beautiful it's a beautiful shot they yeah they cool? all had to share the same lens because only one of them had a macro lens that's right <laughs> so i had to take turns shooting in it so it's a small flower or... yeah it's really small sarah said uh like in her photo the area size of it was like really tiny like maybe as big as the sensor or a little bit bigger uh huh. So, so it's, it's like one to one. So a lot of stacking here, then, right? Yeah, focus stacking. Yeah, I'm sure. This is a little wider than hers, but still pretty tight. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love how like the petals just fill the frame. Like there's no gaps at all or anything. It's like just a perfect, perfectly balanced composition. And then that blue color is really nice. And then the I'm the textured little the hairs are really unique. The way they fill it in. Filling out the frame perfectly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just uh, congrats. 
Yeah, I can't think of any any plant I know of around here for sure, that, or that I've ever run into that kind of looks like that. You know, that's why I'm somewhere out there, Jimmy. What's that? That's why I live here and not up there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's just good for the beer. So I just keep you up there. <laughs> you're not allowed to move. Yeah, you're kind of <laughs> making my New Year's resolutions here. I'm like, let's cut off Eric. Let's be you are not in my life anymore. We'll get that no taken care of on Monday. <laughs> I better put in an order in tonight then. Right. Yeah, get it while you can. <laughs> that's why I was shopping this morning. <laughs> Yeah, this one's awesome. I'm pretty jealous of this pretty one as well. Much. I wouldn't mind having it in my portfolio. Yeah, we're all, let's steal it from him. Yeah. <laughs> we can just tell AI to like remake it, but slightly different, yeah. and we'll have our own. Using AI, put some uh, early morning light on it. Yeah, tell it to make it better. Do this, yeah. but a little better. Just improve yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah this is... Uh, Rax, Ragnar Axelsson, good, good friend of mine, uh, Icelandic iconic photographer depicting uh, the high Arctic, uh, Greenland, Iceland, people who are living there in, in, the, in the wilderness and uh, hunters. In, he did, um, uh, made a couple of books on, um, on uh, Inuits, uh, hunters ha hunting uh, polar bears and People living in here. Here is Chuck from Iceland. It's from uh, the ice cave on, on, on the Myrdalsjökull in, in the southern part of Iceland. It's a fantastic ice cave that collapsed just after he took this photo. And I think it's just a really, really rough, uh, fabulous shot. Fabulous shot, really. And he, he works 99% uh, in black and white. And, um, his style is very rough like this, very contrasty and yeah, powerful. Yeah, I've been very. following him like ever since that eruption in Iceland. That was like 2020, I think, maybe 2021. I just remember it was during the pandemic. And so I was like watching video footage of it because they had like cameras set up that had like a live feed 24 seven. And I was watching those every every other day or so to check in and see how the volcano was changing. And he was like one of the people that like was one of the first to make like a really amazing photo of the eruption and stuff. And so that's how I found him. But um, I don't remember ever seeing this photo. Like when you submitted this one, I didn't know who it was by right away, but it totally makes sense that it's him because that dramatic black and white look and everything. And I know like he's a straight photographer, like he doesn't manipulate his photos really, but this photo just feels unreal. Like it just looks like something that would be like AI generated or just, it's just like beyond anything I've ever seen in reality. It's crazy. What he does, he increases the contrast in everything he does. In the old days, he would use uh, like a five-grade uh, paper to to, um, to get more contrast. The files are very different from the ones we get when we convert the color file into black and white. They're very much in, uh, very much like this with a lot of contrast. I like how he has a person in this one to just give it some scale okay. and. Uh... Yeah, it's it's really well done, really. really well, it cool makes it even more surreal too, because it's like, what is a person doing wandering around in this like crazy, yeah, like landscape. inhospitable looking, yeah, alien landscape? Yeah. The mist there is quite. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And as dramatic as it is, there's a there's a really nice subtle flow through it too. You know, with the it's kind of serpentine kind of path leading into that archway. Um, so there's there's a lot of kind of easy places for the eye to wander, even though it is such a kind of dramatic, kind of smacky in the face type of image. Uh, so definitely appreciate that about it. Well, I feel like whenever you have like super crazy subject matter, you need to simplify the composition. Otherwise, it's just too much and it, it gets like chaotic right. and kind of messy feeling. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Do uh, do ice structures like this still exist in Iceland? I've never been. I'm just kind of curious to know how it's holding up with warmer temperatures. It's in, in a really fast transition, but uh, in this location, it's, it's called Katla Ice Cave. It's on the south uh, southeastern part of the Mirda Circle, uh, the second largest glacier there in Iceland. And uh, uh, I was there this year in September, and there was uh, a similar 
uh, like a tube, like um, almost like a subway with arches, a bunch of so arches uh, going right in through the glacier. But they all collapsed, uh, and it melts really fast. So uh, roughly 100 meters per year, at least. The front oh, wow. is retracting 100 meters. So it's, it's in rapid, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, transition. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, time for another uh, <laughs> another beer. It, this is um, a stout from Omnipolo. Ten, nice. It, Very about nice. Seven point five. See what that is like. All right. What ingredients does that have? I don't know. Tor, I think. Tor. <laughs> <laughs> Pouring nice and black. <laughs> Asphalt. No, nothing was lost in translation. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's. Smells no, really like chocolate. Lovely. Fantastic. I had it for Christmas. Gorgeous stuff. Cheers. Do you, you say you're into stouts Cheers. as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I like IPAs the most. That's what I typically drink. But then stouts are probably my second favorite, especially this time of year in the winter. Same here. That's when all the good ones come out, too. So there's there's no notes of surf drumming in there? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't have it here. I had a fantastic photo of my father, you know, eating uh, surströmming fermented herring. It's like it smells like rotten herring. <laughs> <laughs> it's a traditional uh, food here in Sweden. There was a way to they fermented the herring to preserve it. By doing it that way, it it, it you know it, it was kind of preserved or conserved, or what you say, and. Um, mm -hmm. But it smells awful. But I, I was growing up in that area in the north where, where this was a habit, kind of. <laughs> but I, I think it's nothing to write home about, really. It's it smells like hell and uh, like, <laughs> but it, it's not. It it doesn't taste as bad as it smells. But it's not not very good either. <laughs> What do you think so, about uh, Icelandic about my food? comment uh, about my uh, comment I'm earlier? Icelandic uh, <laughs> counterpart, you know, the fermented uh, shark. Gordon Ramsay tried it and he threw up. Yeah, we bought some <laughs> one time because, like, we we're just like, "What's all the hoopla?" Like, we got to check it out. And as soon as I like unpackage it, it just smelled like urine. That that's all I could smell. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like urine, it? uh, urine soaked jerky. I took a bite and it just tasted like rotten flesh. And no. oh, good. Not that I've but tasted urine before. But. Herring, the herring is not like that, you know. It, it's not, it's not disgusting, but it's not. Uh, it's kind of, kind of uh, you feel like kind of ferment, fermentation. It's like um, almost uh, you feel the carbon, 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 well, carbon uh, dioxide. You know, like bubbles almost, right? Mm. In your mouth. Good stuff. Keeps you young. Uh, what were you saying, Jimmy? Uh, it was just at, about my note about Swedish cuisine. Just, yeah. but I'm glad it's evolved. So. Yeah, it yeah it you're evolved. you're reaffirming your stance. <laughs> well, that's what I kind of grew up with. So uh... <laughs> maybe your mom just sucks at cooking, dude. Uh, she uh, does. There's no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> she might not be country. watching the show. He didn't mean that. No, Jimmy's she, smart enough. Mom. Jimmy's smart enough not to show his mom this show. <laughs> no, she, she. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know she, <laughs> she'll find it, and I'll be a dead man if she ever finds it. But that's right. <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons other than that. <laughs> True story. Yeah, you'll be dead by the time she gets to this episode. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. This one's super nice. I had never heard of Chris this. Bell before, though, so that's cool to learn about a new photographer. Yeah, in uh, 96, I went to uh, Tasmania and for photography with my wife, and uh, like uh, most of the times, I went into a bookstore and I found several books by Chris Bell and uh, some books by uh, Dombrovskis. Uh, yeah, Peter, Peter Dombrovsky. Peter Dombrovskis as well, and. I, I thought I should call one of these guys because they were living in, they were both from Tasmania. So I called Chris Bell and um, asked him if we could uh, meet and we met and uh, yeah, we um, kind of started to like each other and uh, 
we've had a contact ever since. This is a, since, since it was in '96 when I met him first time. I, I took him over to Sweden for uh, two uh, slideshows, '97 and uh, it was 2000, 2003 or something. Uh, and he's very much into uh, quite a lot of like intimate stuff, like Porter. And he's a really purist. I mean, he would not never move a, a leaf, you know, in this picture. I would probably move the, a few leaves here. But uh, what you see is what, what he saw. And uh, I think this is quite interesting. It's a very much in a reporter style. Uh, small on the, on the forest floor. And I like the colors. And, uh, yeah, lovely shot, I think. Four by five. I think what makes this one is, um, you know, like the leaves are nice and like those little seed pod things are nice. Those little like little balls, uh, whatever they are. But what's really cool is that like bluish kind of like pollen maybe or like some kind of needles from a tree that are just filling it all in with that nice background texture yeah, and I'm color. Really, yeah, amazing. Yeah, the tones are really nice and very complimentary. Yeah, and it's yeah. like... Uh, it feels very organic, but it's still very well uh, framed and everything. So it's all flowing nicely, not all over the place. Is this um, sitting on water, do you think? Or yeah, I'm just getting a. So it looks like, yeah. Like a small pond or like a puddle covered in some kind of pollen or something, and then leaves and yeah. other stuff that fell on it and is floating. It's amazing. Yeah. I love the shapes and I love the, the kind of imperfections, you know, like the holes in the leaves. It's just very natural scene. I think like you said, Hans, it's just kind of as he saw it. Um, you can, that definitely comes through and I appreciate that. That one blue leaf with the two like yellow seeds on it is a really cool detail too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nice like anchor. Yeah, your eye is just going around and around. It's so unlike anything we have here in North America. Mm -hmm. We can't say I've yeah. ever seen anything like that. So Hans, uh, Peter Dombrowski, Chris Bell, and Peter Lick are your three favorite Australian photographers. Uh, Peter Lick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very subtle in its colors, you know. I think it's yeah. everything is so um, down to earth there. Yeah. Really. <laughs> no, not really. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> Authentic. Nothing's been touched. Yeah. No, yeah. Here I am at the horseshoe. Well, I try to survive. It's very. You know, it's 200 meters down, but I try to not fall. Yeah, oh crap. And thousands of tourists there every day. I mean, <laughs> another one. Yeah, gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Antelope Canyon. Yeah, Antelope Canyon. Gosh. The ghost. That's yeah. a place that is also sad, like what it's turned into. I've never photographed it. It looks like the most scenic, just incredible slot canyon ever. But it's yeah. been ruined by tourism and stuff. Like, I don't think yeah. you can have any kind of a spiritual or meaningful experience there anymore with how it is. It sucks. I was there in mm -hmm. 1990. I was there by myself and uh, an Indian guy who brought me in there. And uh, then I was there in, in 92. There were a couple of guys in there. And then I was there in 96 and it was packed with people. Mm. Absolutely terrible wow can you imagine it today i bet it is just yeah. a complete circus yeah yeah i've heard yeah no thank well, you no tripods yeah. or anything allowed right at this point okay you have to book a special kind of tour to be able to use a tripod it's like a photography tour but it's still very rushed and fast paced and everything i think and you're with like 30 yeah. other people yeah there's like no such thing as like a private one-on-one -on -one tour anymore i don't think yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, Unless thanks. you have like thousands of dollars, maybe to bribe somebody. Would you, uh, would you crack open there, uh, Bennett? So this is, I'm moving on to stouts now, but, uh, still along the breakfast theme. This is a blueberry pancake, Imperial pastry stout, nice. uh, bourbon barrel age as well from my guys here in Salt Lake TF brewing. Haven't tried this one yet. It came out like late summer, but I've been hanging on to it. Um, so I thought it'd be great to crack it now that I'm day drinking. <laughs> yeah, floodgates are open. <laughs> Has a lot of barrel smell to it. How is it? Give us uh give us an update. It's nice. 
pretty smooth. Nice. The the blueberry is pretty subtle, as well as the maple. But um, yeah, nice solid stout. Got some coffee and uh, chocolate flavors in there, and it's uh twelve percent. So, mm. hey, you're you're popping the lid off it, dude. I'm. <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. I've got a. 11% stout sitting in front of me unopened and a 6% smoothie. I'm trying to uh, decide what kind of day I'm going to have. <laughs> <laughs> go big nice. or go home, dude. Day yeah, it's time. like it's like which one? Yeah. Oh my god. Jimmy's cracking one of my favorite stouts from last year. Holy that, smokes. That's made from asphalt. That is <laughs> I still have, a, I still have yeah. a bottle of that one in my fridge. I've got a couple holes in my driveway. I might <laughs> Fill this in. Gotcha. Oh my goodness! So this that was is, such, uh, that was such a good one. This one is from Equilibrium uh, down in Middletown, New York. So it's banana pancake, and oh boy, this is an imperial stat with Thai banana, which I'm hitting like it's it pops right out at you. Coconut, maple Love syrup, that. almonds, cinnamon, marshmallow, Monster coffee, and lactose. Um, so it's a collaboration with uh, Jay Wakefield Brewing and Mostra Coffee. Yeah, that one's eleven percent. Yeah, wow, that smells amazing. I was very disappointed. I was in England signing the books uh, 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 a month ago, and I went to some pubs, and they have only the five percent stuff. Mm. I, I don't want to have anything less than uh, eight, eight and a half. But they yeah. Had five, four point five, five point two. Water. Yeah, dishwater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta have at least eight percent, right? Yeah. yeah. To make it sing, but but you know, America in the old days were like, uh, uh, you know, uh, all these cores and. Uh, uh, Budweiser and stuff, beers, they were like 3%. Where were they? I mean, mm -hmm. they put a pitcher on your table and it was like drinking water. Yep. Yeah, we say yeah. Uh, we say those beers are like sex in a canoe. Yeah, yeah. Fucking, yeah. Like fucking to close to water. water. <laughs> 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 long ago. 30 years ago, you had nothing like this. Yeah, Did the you? thing is... Uh, in general, with lighter beer, with less alcohol, you add fewer ingredients because you don't need to mask it. So, like, if it's lower ABV, it's not going to be as flavorful, whereas, like, triple IPAs and stuff, they have to mask that boozy flavor. Otherwise, it's not going to be enjoyable, so they jam pack it with hops and ingredients and stuff. But I actually really love, like, a 5% IPA if they've gone overboard with the ingredients still, as they would with, like, a double or a triple like I don't, I don't really care about how much alcohol is in it. It's just usually more alcohol means more flavor because they gotta, they gotta hide it better. So um, if they like, I would drink non-alcoholic beer actually if uh, it tasted the same. Like for me, it's all about the flavor. But um, yeah, like Fidens does really good, like four or five percent IPAs every now and then that are just as mm -hmm. flavorful as their doubles and triples, and I really enjoy mm -hmm. those because they're not as heavy on the system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah some of their singles are, are fantastic. Yeah, like uh, Teacher's Pet, that one's really good usually. And mm -hmm. uh, Grade 10 is a really good all citra single IPA they do. Oscar Wilde said, uh, alcohol taken in sufficient quantities can bring about all the effects of drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love that. That's the downside. <laughs> Or it could be a good a good side also, but yeah. But uh, if if you're into enjoying beers and wine, you're not there for the for the bus. You're there for uh, for the flavors and the aromas and right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you just sip on it and you enjoy it as an experience. Mm -hmm. It's an experience of itself. It's like traveling in a way, you know, experiencing. Yeah flavors and and if you have a good experience you 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 will remember it like a, yeah. like a like a trip somewhere yeah absolutely i i remember all of them right guys every single one <laughs> you totally do actually i think it's you ridiculous do, honestly. yeah this one's really crazy oh, and this is this insane. i would think this is like a hans Strand photo almost if i saw this somewhere and didn't right. see a name 
the the contrast yeah. is a little different than your work but uh you know this kind of subject matter is similar to your farmland type stuff yeah i think uh i think uh, I, I snatched it from his uh uh, website. Uh, I think it's not really a represent representative in terms of contrast. It's a little bit rough, and it's not super sharp either. But Edward Bertinsky is a house god sort of. You know what he's doing is just fantastic. He's um, photographing the influence of of uh, man um, changing the crust of the earth, uh, depicting Anthropocene. You know the new age as we have just entered where man has become the most influential influential uh, force uh, on on the crust of the earth and uh, here we see uh, uh, salt marshes uh, evaporation uh, dams where they uh, evaporate uh, seawater and get sea salt this is in the cadiz in uh, southern spain and i think it just had a, this is incredible shot from a helicopter incredible stuff mm. and his work in general i think is just admirable what right. he's doing uh, he recently made a book uh, called african studies big fat book published by steidel in germany where he has been photographing uh, man's impact on on the landscape in africa and um important stuff and it has a uh, another layer to it because it includes the uh, environmental uh, component uh, that we sometimes miss you know we, we go for beauty he goes for uh, messages you know with his work every picture tells the story yeah you should look him up he, uh, his yeah, books are fantastic super well printed yeah, yeah i'm one, looking at him yeah yeah he had one called the uh, is african studies and they had one before that called anthropocene and he had one called water and one called salt pants one called uh, what it called? Uh, natural order china yeah yeah a lot of books but fantastic work fantastic i had heard of anthropocene before but um, and, I don't own any of his books. His prints are, are selling for $50,000 per print. Oh, nice. Mikey yeah. was probably thinking about ordering one just now. Yeah, it's going to cancel that order. I'm just going to have to back out of that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got – He's a, that's a really great um, great find there. He's his got some really amazing stuff, uh, Hans. I'm looking yeah. at his images right now. This is an amazing shot for sure, and it's uh, – Really cool work that he's doing as far as the uh, the, the footprint of uh, man on landscape. Is he on Instagram or uh, are you? On yeah, he side? is. Oh, yeah, cool. he's on Instagram. But not himself. It's it, 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 his staff was doing that, but just promoting. Yeah, same, it looks same like. as my account. I don't run it. I have my agent do it. Yeah. <laughs> Your team. Oh, oh, team taking care of that. <laughs> yeah. Eric Bennett Photography <laughs> Corporation Limited. I mean, it's, he's uh, got some stunning work. Jeez. This image is crazy because those the lines, you know, are coming together in the center top, you know, from left to right. It's just, you know, the, the likelihood that, that that would actually occur is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like become a cohesive scene somehow. Right. Yeah, right. It's super crazy. It's insane. Well, the thing is it's not the uh boosting his images up with uh, wh what I used to call uh, Photoshop uh, gymnastics either. It's it's very authentic. He's very keen on making his photograph uh, trustworthy. So this is the way it looks. Are you still photographing a lot of stuff like this, Hans? Like uh, this kind of series that you're doing of man-made landscapes or have you slowed down on that? I, I need to find uh, sponsor uh, sponsors i need to find people paying for the the flights i can't afford them myself so i i was in spain uh, this year photographing the uh, farmland and i had some people paying for the helicopter and i hope to return next year as well doing more of my plan is to make a book uh, eventually on spanish farmland because they are fantastic really and uh also, there is a, like a hidden message be, be, behind that because uh, man is taking all the landscape, which once was uh, a complex, having a lot of biodiversity.
diversity and now it's transformed into monocultures uh farm, farmlands you know yeah i put just put a hell of a lot of new pictures on my website i noticed you updated it i i had given you some shit for not having enough stuff on there because you yeah. had it really tightly curated but it, it's like all new stuff you still don't have like a lot of your older stuff on there yet yeah I, I, I'm starting to do that. I put uh, maybe 70 pictures at least uh, the last days on my, it's an ongoing project, but I put a lot of new stuff, uh, new farmland uh, on the concept, a bit like this, but with farmlands. Do you have any older work that you've like lost now? Like you've misplaced slides or like yeah, files sure. on older hard drives or anything you can't recover I anymore? I have, uh, I have uh, cases uh, of, what do you say? baskets of, of uh transparencies transparencies that should have been done uh, a lot a lot a lot of really a lot of stuff uh, is not scanned but i I'll, i must say i'm not really super excited when i see the result because when you were using uh transparencies you were you were uh, you were dealing with uh a contrast range of five stops, no more than that. When you were shooting Valvia from black to white, five stops, and now when you use uh, modern cameras, you you have well, you have thirteen to fifteen stops, and it's like fishing with a huge uh, trawler. You know, you have everything is in there, all the shadows, <laughs> all the highlights. In the old days, you had to go for the highlights, and and all the shadows turn black, and you can can't to open up the shadows when you scan them and you try to open up the shadows it's just turning gray you know there's no information in there so uh the only uh, transparency that work is uh, the ones with very low contrast and then they can look fabulous when you scan them but uh, i must say the, re the technical result Shooting uh, digital is way superior to shooting film, uh, chrome film. Maybe if you were shooting neg film, it would be a different story, but I never shoot shot like that. Yeah, I just wonder, because I think about like my hard drives failing or like stuff like that, like what I would do if I lost some work, but because uh, I don't have like a super great backup system yet, but I, I can only imagine like, I've only been doing this for 10 years. If I had been doing this for like 40 years, how stressful that would be to try to keep everything. Yeah, I, I've lost uh, I've lost a lot of files from failing hard drives, and it's just to go further, you know, move on, just forget it. Yeah, make new stuff. That's what I figure. Like if I lost everything, I would just make new stuff anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just move on. It's that you can't do anything about it. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. So what's that process like with like finding sponsors for flights and like certain projects you want to do, like to get funding? How do you even go about that? Uh, it's frustrating because you have you have a few people you know and uh, they're quite busy normally and and uh, it's hard to find new one. Yeah, I don't know. I ask myself. I I, I want to go in uh, in June now uh, next year to Spain and um, I need two two people plus me to to uh, be in the helicopter to they pay for the flight and. I, I'm flying for free, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I take I take them there, so they get pictures, of course, the same more or less as I do. But um, you know, it it uh, it costs a fortune to fly. Are, are you running on fumes? What do you mean? Yeah, too little. In. <laughs> you know, I, I'm um, I'm almost on fumes here. I have to ask call for my wife to. Fill it up. <laughs> nah, I've still got a lot. Yes. Yes. I, I just did. cracked a new one. Yeah, what are you yeah. drinking, Paul? Um I cracked open I, I drink I've had the double stack on here before, but this is the uh, Christmas version. Um it's an Imperial Breakfast Stout, keeping uh, in line with uh my time zone because it's still eleven fifteen here. I think all of you have uh, hit the afternoon hours, but uh, it's an imperial stout uh, with coffee, maple syrup, and uh, and some caramel. So uh, this is this one's really good. I mean, they always they always really do a good job with this one. Comes out a couple times a year. Uh, this is the first time I've seen like a Christmas version of it, and it's it's pretty tasty. 
Yeah, that one's um, classic. Just straight up coffee and uh, pancakes. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, it, it like we're turning into styles so almost all of us here, right? That's yeah. right. Wait, so I, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Is I started out with the imperial stout, and I'm going, uh, and you guys started with uh, sours and stuff, and so now I'm kind of basically reversing my direction. So this is a um, Mortalis Gemini sour ale brewed with raspberry, banana, granola, and yogurt. That that's one's really stout. good. I had that last weekend for Christmas. Yeah, Holy Christmas looking forward morning. to it. Seven percent. So going from a stout to this. I wait, drank wait, that I... one while mm. looking at uh, Trim Bergsma's book. Uh, yeah. I finally got it. Yeah, My Land. Yeah, really nice. <laughs> Beautiful Hans. book. Fantastic book. Hans, have you ever had a uh, one of the uh, sour smoothies? No, not really. No. Oh, they're great. Yeah, I, Omni I need... Polo does them every now and then I've seen. Mm, so okay. Good. I, I need to search them out. You know, I, yeah, I'm still a, a beginner. Yeah, but it's just like a fruit smoothie. It's nothing like a beer, but it's nice to throw into the rotation to change it up every now and then. I wonder if we would get out in the field, uh, Eric, if I would come over. Yeah, would... if you come over here, I'll show you everything. Uh, I wouldn't get out. We would be sitting here, sipping all day long, right? At camp. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, that sounds fine. You guys are gone for five days and took three photographs. <laughs> in the sky with diamond. <laughs> yeah, we can do some of that too. <laughs> That'd be a good trip. Literally. And that, that smoothie went down like super easily, but now that I'm, I've taken a few sips of the stout, mm. I'm really starting to feel it. It hits you totally differently. It's weird. Yeah. It really does. This is so good. It's like not only the ABV, it's like the style of beer just hits you differently. Like stouts just smack you in the face. Like on that first sip, you feel, yeah. you feel a buzz already. I feel like IPAs, even if they're like the same percentage, they you digest them differently or something. I wonder if the viewers are getting as excited as we are. Of course they are. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the edge of their seats. <laughs> Aaron, I hope you understand us. We, we're having a good time here. and uh, Exactly. Yeah. Forgive us, forgive us. Nah, nothing wrong with having a good time. That's right. Yeah. Looking at Edward Bertinsky and this guy, Chris de Berg, he is just fantastic. Yeah, fellow Swede. Yeah. He's got Incredible. really great stuff. Incredible. Uh, he, he finds things where no one else is finding anything to photograph. And uh, he's an incredible visual poet, I would say. You know, it was difficult to find one of his shots, but I think this is quite remarkable. And yeah, we uh, featured we featured him maybe three or four times on the show now. We love his stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah cool, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, and I love this one that because it is a lot different from most of at least his more recent work and the other uh, images that we featured. This one's, you know, significantly different. So, you know, I'm glad you chose this one, Hans, because it is obviously it's a fantastic image, but it's a little bit of a departure from um what we've shown before yeah cool i included some swedish guys and uh because uh i thought you were more into uh how to say more aware of what was happening in north america but this guy is uh he's a genius do you follow bill ferngren as well hans no not really bill bill ferngren no not really no he's not a swedish I... photographer that has really good stuff i think you would love his yeah. work okay i need to find him yeah sorry but, yeah, uh, you should definitely I, look him up. Yeah, really he's talented here yeah, a couple for times. sure. Okay. Yeah, he's got some really great stuff. Holy Christ! I have to look that up. Yeah, look him up on Instagram <laughs> right now. Yeah, th this one's really cool, and this is another image where I can totally see why you chose it because this feels like a Hans Strahn image. Not to like uh, discredit it at all. Um, Christopher Berg has a great portfolio and very much has his own style and everything, but. I'm going to see Hans, like, you know, he loves ice patterns and chaotic uh, patterns like this, but making them cohesive still. And yeah, this one's really cool. It has like the feathery ice patterns, like all around the edges. And then that really complex, like triangular sharp ice in the middle. Crazy. Man, this, this is so good. Imagine this, like a large print on the wall. It's really cool, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it'd be, it'd be phenomenal. This is just like... <laughs> 1.5 meters. I, I, I'm not sure what he's using. If it's 
if he's into medium format or what he's, what he's doing, what he's using, I don't know. It's, it's really cool because, I mean, for me, I kind of started in the middle, but then you work the whole entire scene with your eyes. I mean, there's just so much really great stuff happening here. It's just so interesting. Yeah, and there were, the surroundings, uh, there were like supporting actors. In the middle, yeah. there, we have Robert De Niro in the center there. And the rest <laughs> of, like, Matt Damon and, uh, and uh, whatever. Well, if, it's, if it's Robert De Niro, it's probably Joe Pesci around the edges. <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Look at your shine box. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ray Liotta. Right. Yeah. So I, I, what I what I like about this is like it, there's this kind of dichotomy between the textures. Like um, you had pointed out, like there's the kind of the feathery ice and then the shards of ice. And to me, those have two very drastically different feels. Like if this image was just all the feathery ice, it's kind of this softer, mm -hmm. kind of sort of more gentle feel. Whereas those shards are, you know, they're they're fairly aggressive and sort of kind of menacing. And so kind of the blending of the two of them, especially with those shards in the middle surrounded by the feathers, just I, just that kind of play on on textures is really cool and really well yeah. done yeah i agree absolutely yeah fantastic yeah we love christer's stuff great stuff this wow. one's really crazy just like a mosaic of right. so th this That's must crazy. be like an aerial like a bit higher up or do you know i, I, I think it, it's a drone shot okay i'm pretty sure it was a drone those shot. tiles are just so small and intricate that's three. Yeah, but I, I think it's shot from fairly high. You know, I, I mean, uh, not uh, hundreds of meters, but maybe uh, 30 meters. Right. Uh, that's my guess. In one of these uh, uh, kind of volcanic areas in Iceland. Uh, that's my guess. And um, I've seen various shots of him, uh, of Kai Horn on uh, all of those cracks, and I, I think there are, he has made some fantastic crack shots. I call him the crack ma master, really. <laughs> yeah. I, think he, I thought that was Paul. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just on the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, crazy. Same thing. I would love this on the wall, you know, like a, like a absolutely hysterical almost like a jackson pollock painting yeah. chaotic right really super super chaotic that's a that's a great comment hans like something like this on the wall i mean you could really put this thing anywhere and it just kind of would really blend in and be really complement space imagine a big villa i don't have that i'm living in small apartments <laughs> in a big villa you know and white walls and you have this like a two meter print of this you know holy crap right. yeah well and it's you know it's a type of image you could see you just kind of get lost in and stare at for hours and so when you take something like that that has that quality and you print it really big it's that much more impactful so yeah i agree i think this will look great covering the entire wall yeah what i like about this one is like the the structure of like the bigger tiles on the left and they slowly transition to smaller tiles on the right but then you have like that blue tone on the left and that subtle blue uh yellow tone on the right side like that's a really nice addition to Changes. add some interest yeah. here yeah right, for sure. that warm and cool without yeah. that it'd just be kind of like too uniform but that breaks it up really nicely like kind of like splashes of paint or something yeah yeah it definitely has a jackson pollock like feel to it i agree actually that's something i try to look for if i find something that is Jack jackson polish pollock ish uh, i like that when it's like um almost like war of the ants uh, and, and you have more or less the same thing happening in any any part of the picture it's the same thing happen happening mm -hmm. you know it's like you could use chaos super intricate yeah. chaos yeah nope. he has a uh, he has a really nice um iceland pro portfolio as well yeah, yeah he has an yeah. aerial from there that's like these like rivers and like this kind of volcano looking green like cone thing yeah. that's insane like one of the yeah. coolest photos from Iceland I've ever seen yeah from uh, up in the highlands yeah 
Yep. Yep. I know. I know nuts. exactly what now you're talking about. It has like about. really, really cool sunset or sunrise light. That's a super epic photo. Part of the uh, one of the things that this image reminds me of is the like the bottom side of a leaf, you know, with all mm -hmm. the, the the venation that occurs. Yeah, it, yeah it's it's leaf. Yeah. Also, like, like a, a mosaic from the antique, antique, you know, from from Greece or uh, whatever in the church. Oh, yeah. The mosaics on the uh, on the floor or whatever they had. Yeah, yeah, I, I think awesome. it's a masterpiece. Yeah, this one's really crazy. I'd never heard of Anders Angelhag. Yeah. Yeah, he wow. joined one of my workshops uh, in Lufut and uh, some years ago, and he's by far the most talented uh, guy in, in 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 the group. And uh, and now this year, I, I found him on. Uh, I, I looked at the pictures on this natural, uh, what's called Natural Landscape Photography Award or something mm. like that. And he, he was number two or three. He should have won, I think. And I think this picture is like, uh, it's like a dream, you know, like from from a you know Lord of the Rings or whatever. It is, you know, it's just a fairy tale shot. Absolutely crazy. Fantastic shot. Uh, this one I'm drooling over. <laughs> yeah, it's very ethereal and somewhat spooky and mysterious. Mm. Really unique landscape. Yeah, I love the uh, the tunnel effect, you know, that he captured here, you know, with the reflection and all of that. It just kind of pulls you right through the image. Yeah, this yeah. reminds me of the kind of stuff that you shoot in Sweden, Hans, like those really scraggly, like, forests. Yeah, I wish I had one of these, but I'm nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. I can see this one as well, like the one from Alex. I feel both of them. Yeah. I was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around longer than they have, so you have that on your side. Yeah, he's got some really amazing stuff, Hans. I'm looking at it right now. Really, really yeah. great, por really great portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very, very gifted guy. Yeah, I'm excited to go check out his work because I'd never heard of him. Yeah, it's so it's so weird uh, whenever I notice uh, trees coming out of water, like the way he's captured it here. It's it's just an unusual find, at least where where I live. So um, either beavers have been present, or something's flooding it, or it feels quite different. You know, you you have the swamps in in the. Louisiana, Texas, Florida, but this is different. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's really unique. Yeah. And uh, this one is nuts. I, I recognize this one because um, I'm a huge fan of Sebastián Salgado. Mm. I actually uh, <coughs> have his uh, monster of a book, Genesis, here, which I highly recommend to anybody if it's still yeah. on sale but uh, or for sale. But... Um, yeah, absolutely epic photography. This one's from Antarctica. Yeah, uh, it's from, uh, Georgia Savodov Island. Savodov no, no, no. Savodovsky Island in the South Sandwich Island. It's extremely remote. Uh, it's it's um, further away from uh, South America than South Georgia. It's another couple of days of uh, traveling by boat. And you can only enter the island as far as I know, on one spot, very difficult to come ashore. It's it's a cliff island with an active volcano, and it has the largest population of what is it, uh, chin strap uh, or uh, rock copper penguins or something like five hundred thousand couples of penguins living on this island. And and uh, I saw a documentary um, with Sebastião Salgado, and you know. To, to jump on to this island, you have there's an amplitude of uh, several meters. You have to jump when the boat is the highest position, you jump to the cliff, you know. And he's seven. <laughs> he's not a young guy. He's 70 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he was funny. He's maybe 73, 74 now. But when he did this, and yeah, it's an, uh, admirable. It's really, uh, this is like uh, the Gardens of Eden, I think. Extremely wild. Extremely wild, you know. Yeah, I also have this like autobiography type book by him that I really enjoyed reading from my land to the planet. Yeah. Um, 
He's a really remarkable person too, because he and his wife like bought a bunch of land in Brazil, and they restored the natural ecosystem there just by planting like the native plants again. All the wildlife, like uh, panthers or whatever they are, like uh, just all these birds, like all these animals, slowly returned, and now they, I think they turned it into a national park now. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Leopards, I think they were. Yeah, but it's super crazy. Um, Hmm. super cool project that he did and uh yeah his work is phenomenal it's all black and white uh yeah. i believe it's all film or is he shooting some digital stuff now uh, i think it's a digital actually it was film yeah. uh, part of the book are shot on film but uh and the later part is shot uh with i think he's using a canon and um, yeah you you can't see the difference, really. but uh, I I met him uh, in Stockholm uh, maybe three four years ago, five years ago when he had an exhibition, and uh, I asked him about that, and he 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 he's in, he's using uh, digital now. Nice guy, really nice guy. So yeah, there there are quite a few uh, photographers nowadays, despite the abilities of. Uh modern cameras that still choose to shoot on film and like large format film and stuff today. What, what made you want to transition to digital instead of like hanging on to that? Because it's so much better. It's simple as that. I, I, I can't see any reason uh, messing around with uh, clumsy uh, equipment that is less, less good as the, the, the equipment I have today. You know, it's as simple as that. It's, well, it's, well, I feel uh, like I, I feel like it's because they enjoy the process, like how it forces you to slow down, and they enjoy those constraints right. because it has a certain effect on what they create. Yeah. yeah but sure. you you don't feel like you lost any of that when you transitioned. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, and, and you know, it's it's. Uh, I used to say I was shooting eight by ten in the end of the analog period, and I must say it was a very complicated way of, of wasting money. <laughs> it costs a fortune to make you know every single exposure and you don't have a better hit rate if you shoot with an 8x10 camera than with a, a modern DSLR or a medium format yeah it's still around you decide to go for one one shot and that takes about 15 20 minutes to accomplish and then the situation is if, if you're working with light you can just Forget it because you're, you're way too slow, right? And uh, and uh, if if it's constant light, you you're working with money, you know, because you can't shoot like you can today, you know. And um, uh, you can you can of course say that it's a different uh, expression. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. If it's black and white uh, negs, maybe maybe it's a different. Uh, shooting, uh, shooting color and converting into black, black and white. But if you're if you were into um, shooting uh, chromes, uh, I would say it's it's way way behind shooting digital today. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Like the medium is the message. So, like the tools you use influence the things you create with those tools, um, like by their nature. Right. So, like you know, having fewer bullets is going to make you. It's going to force you to be more intentional to, with how you use them and uh you have to slow down because the equipment is a bit more clunky and it's not as fast and everything and it's it's a lot more difficult to set up and change things around dial things in but i just enjoy personally like experimenting with stuff and like not having any kind of pressure and just being able to freely like explore different subjects and try out lots of different angles and things like that so that's why i've never felt drawn to film no, um, and you you kind of uh, you know you're way too slow, and, and uh, like I said, you have one or two bullets. That's what you have, and and uh, the hit rate is not not at all greater than with any other, you know, with with a, a digital camera. But with a digital camera, you you're done in thirty seconds to a minute, you have made your shots and you can move on and make a different composition, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it's a big big advantage. Well I think it's also a misconception too that you like can't be as deliberate with digital equipment because 
I mean, you can spend as much time as you want with the subject. Like even after you've taken the photo, you can still hang out and enjoy the scene and you don't have to rush on to the next thing. Or like a lot of the time I spend is like observing stuff before I even use my camera at all. So like you can practice digital photography in a similar way and, and still be intentional and everything, even without those constraints that force you to do it. If you're, if you're mindful of them. But of course, it's admirable that people were able to make those fantastic shots in the <laughs> right. way when you didn't have the repeatability that you have today. Um, but most of these guys were shooting uh, uh, with roll uh, with either a thirty-five or with roll film. But if you shot with uh, with speed um, film, you, you ended up shooting stone, you know, stone or something that was standing still because then you had the time to to um the camera up and and do a decent composition and that's a problem you, you, your photography tend to become very stiff if you if you uh if you shoot with too clumsy equipment mm -hmm. and, i can see uh, that and, yeah, uh, think... rock, stone and rock is not yeah, it can be interesting, but but you have less freedom. Yeah, I, I found that the film always kind of limited me, like in yeah. terms of what in terms of what you could shoot, because um, so that exposure latitude was so tight. You know, it's just yeah. you, you would take multiple exposures to the same image, and maybe you'd get one. You know, mm. so and you need to bracket, and you have to be spot on on the quarter of a stop to at least precise to get the maximum out of a shot whereas today it's not you don't have to be that accurate it's like like i said before like fishing with a big net with a big troll <laughs> you have the picture somewhere in between between the boundaries right yeah jimmy needs all the help he, he can get to so right jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> for me what's what's super like kind of disorienting in a way about this image is it feels like a really vast landscape like that volcano in the background is really far away but then the penguins they give you a different sense of scale because you can see like those penguins way off in the distance you can still see them and they're not yeah. large creatures so it's kind of interesting it's like it feels like a really vast landscape but then the penguins make it yeah that's a good point really. actually Mm -hmm. Just the yes. name, Sabodovsky yeah. Island, is not give you a kind of goose pimples. Sabodovsky, yeah. no, it's the northernmost of these South Sandwich Islands. You can look it up on on Google Earth if you want. It, it's not not a big place at all, but it What's has it? Hundred mm. thousand couple, couples of penguins there. What what did you call it, Hans? Sabodovsky with a with a Z. Okay, it's like a Russian name. Yeah, I think so. Zavodovsky Island. Look at it. Yeah. Yeah, check out flights to there, Mikey. See if we can go. Yeah. Well, they have a huge on. airport. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a place where very, very few people have been to. You probably, probably need special permission and probably some all sorts of things. I don't think any photographer that I know of have been there. Yeah. So he did a, a fantastic job. He also went to. Uh, Wrangles Island up there in the high uh, Arctic, uh, close to Bering Sound, um, the Russian island photograph. I think he was there for just 24 hours or something. He, he was, uh, there were too many polar bears around him. They had to fly him out in a helicopter. Uh, yeah, it looks, looks like it's by the White Sea and they call it um, Islands of Death. Yeah. <laughs> That's that mysterious. That's badass. It's it's yeah. a gr grim place. That volcano is active, you know. It spewing out uh, poisonous gases and lava and shit, you know. And these guys <laughs> are during this. I have no other place to go. This is our home. Wow, what that's love, a, that's that's cool. What I love about his book Genesis that I shared, it's like ten years of work where he was photographing uh, landscapes as opposed to like he he was doing a lot of. Uh, he was like photographing humans and mines and like humans, like refugees and stuff like that before this. And then he decided to do a project that was just like all nature. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was, he was kind of doing like journalism work, like very artistic journalist, journalist stuff. And, uh, but then with this project for Genesis, like he went to Utah and he went to Patagonia, like places that we're familiar with. But then he also went to these places that like 
no one else has photographed before. Like he visited these yeah. tribes in the Amazon that have never had contact with modern civilization and like yeah. took all these photos of them and stuff. And like, there's just really interesting stories and photography in there. It's, and it's all very dramatic and moody and very evocative. That's wild. And did you see his work from uh, the Ku Kuwait war in 91, 92, whenever it was? He, I might have. He photographed the uh, oil wells that were burning. And mm. uh, he, destroys his, he destroyed his hearing, hearing that. <laughs> he told me that he um, it was so noisy. It was such a hard sound from from the oil coming up bursting up from the from the ground and uh, it was like standing next to a jet engine and he didn't have any wow. hearing position. and um, after that he, his hearing went down you know he destroyed his hearing but his photographs from there are just incredible i've but i've he, seen some of i've seen i've seen those photographs that that perfect. that is pretty amazing captures and and, and his film uh, uh, What's called uh, Salt of the Earth. You can find it on YouTube. Yeah, it's all it's people. Documentary on his uh, photography. It's like a retrospective. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I, I would say one of the three best photographers ever lived, I would say, on, on this planet. Yeah, in uh, the forward for this book, like, he talks about what made him want to go on this journey to create this project. And uh, he said like he had just photographed and experienced like so much death and sadness and like starvation and human despair that uh, he himself was affected so much that like he said he like he couldn't like in his own words, he couldn't make love to his wife anymore. And he was just like ejaculating blood and uh, Jesus. He went oh, to a wow. doctor and the doctor said like your organs are shutting down like you're slowly dying just because like seeing so much horror and death and everything like it was affecting himself and like his body was shutting down and so he went on this like self-healing journey to just like commune with nature again and make all these images and uh yeah it's pretty crazy like the, his dedication to everything he's done and his photographs of like the millions of people in these mines and like the Congo and stuff are just they're staggering like it's crazy like the humans just look like ants and they're like on all these ladders and stuff and this like super deep yeah, pit that's, in the earth that's in Brazil the it was a gold mine in Brazil right Th those uh, that's think so. like uh, medieval very medieval stuff yeah horrible conditions and you just can't even believe that there's people living their lives like that it's just so different than anything we experience in first world countries yeah yeah, I, I must say, I can't think of any better photography than Sebastian Salgado. It, it's um, his work uh, from the beginning to now is just absolutely uh, astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you featured one of his images because he's one of my favorites. We just yeah. usually try to get permission from photographers before we share their work. So, like, I didn't know how to get in touch with him. But I'm sure if he or, like, one of his agents ever came across this video and saw that Hans Strawn featured it and you know we're just we, saying positive things yeah, I don't think they would get, mind but we get sued right <laughs> <laughs> well we don't have any money so they can't come after us for that but yeah right <laughs> we have beer but that's better. they can ask they us go. to take the video down <laughs> and send them a six pack but yeah they're empty. gonna take our beers <laughs> yeah, we'll yes. strip our beer license <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, he's he's incredible. Yeah. Anybody that's watching this that isn't familiar with his work, definitely pick up one of his books, Genesis. I highly recommend if you're a landscape photographer, and uh, check out his website and stuff. And he's on Instagram as well. He posts some stuff on there every now and then, or somebody does for him. Really remarkable person. Oh, and the nice yeah. guy. Um, he, uh, I had the book with me, and he signed it for me, and he. He signed it with with those four letters with a point between each letter. I would pro was probably uh, I don't know if it was his name or what. It was. <laughs> I, I, it was strangest uh, strangest um, signature I've ever seen. So you met him in person? Where was that? Yeah. In Stockholm. Here, yeah. Wow. So he nice was doing guy. like a tour. Uh, no, it was he had uh, this uh, 
Genesis uh, expedition, uh, exhibition, and I, I just ran into him and I had a chat with him for five ten minutes. That's awesome. Nice, really nice guy. His his stuff is so powerful. Yeah. Oh yeah, it'll make you cry. Yeah, very evocative. I mean, yeah. I mean, it just it just grabs your soul. Yeah. I mean, it's like he's he's documenting at the same time he's like sharing art. I mean, it's just. I'm looking at his stuff right now since it's it's very it's, it's crazy. and it's it's all black and white and there isn't a single photo where you even like for a second wish like oh I wish I, I wish I could see this in color it's all no just way. perfectly mm -hmm. done like that's how it needs to be no that's a really good comment like no question even the oil fields in Kuwait it. you don't yeah. you don't want to see it you don't need to see it it just it translates so good yeah. yeah. I feel like sometimes with black and white, I'm like, oh, I wonder what that would look like in color. Like, it doesn't quite do it for me, but his stuff is just so intentional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. Gorgeous. Black and white master. Yep. That's a that's a great selection, Hans. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is worth the, it'll be worth a year long battle in court. What's that? Was this the last picture? It is, but uh, we can't have you on the show without talking about some of your work for a little bit. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> shot in 96 when I and my wife was in Tasmania. And uh, um, I, I first saw Chris Bell, you know, the guy you saw before here, and uh, said, you should go to Little Fisher River. It's uh, It was a long drive, maybe a seven-hour drive or something up north into the bush and the small dirt roads and and um i hiked in there a lot of a lot of uh leeches gosh i had my my uh, legs did you and, have to go uh, through water or something or no not really but very uh humid very wet huh. i've never heard of leeches being like outside of lakes or ponds yeah, gosh, there was a lot of leeches. Uh, in Australia, well, you can find everything. All fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. sorts of horrible yeah. shit. <laughs> Not, uh, uh, Probably yeah. flying leeches and. <laughs> this was shot with a um, well, a view camera. Linov had a six by nine camera called Technicordon uh, six nine, uh, and um, it was a. It had all the movements of of a large format camera you know tilt and shift and stuff and he could shoot both uh six seven and six nine backs on it and this was shot with a six seven back uh with a kodak film or uh, kodak 100 uh ectochrome 100 s i remember crazy memories but um yeah and with a 58 uh, 58 millimeter schneider super angle on lens Yep. It's interesting how the aspect ratios were like all over the place. Like six by nine is not a common mm -hmm. aspect ratio these days. Oh, that, that's equal to two to three, you know, like a DSLR ratio, six nine. That's okay. a, yeah. that's that ratio. Whereas uh, a six seven is more like uh, almost like four or five, uh, four or, five yeah. or um, four three, closer to four or five, I think. Yeah. Yeah, this looks like four by five to me. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what I loved about this one is it's just, it's just like super Hans drawn. Like I love your woodland work because it's all very cohesive and very well done. But you're not scared of like broken trees or sticks on the ground or like messy kind of stuff. You you actually embrace it and you find a way to make it work and still have a very cohesive flowing composition without anything like drawing your eye too much or breaking the flow or being a distraction. I, I think that's really remarkable because that's not easy to do. So I wanted to feature this one because it's just like the epitome of your work. I feel like kind of the ethos of your photography. I think it's a challenge uh, finding some kind of order out of chaos. It's an old, um, I would say, old uh, expression. In chaos, but it is um, a challenge. It's an intellectual challenge to to, to find a composition that makes sense, even though it's very chaotic, you know? Right. So. Do you ever find scenes that are like inherently just really perfect and neat and think like, 
this is too boring or like this is too perfect i want to find something that's more like messed up or absolutely if it's too perfect it's boring it's like a too strong uh, diagonal or something Uh, like a fallen tree can be too strong a a, a, a component in the picture so it it gives uh, it allows no freedom for the eye to travel inside the picture it's too boring i like it more uh, vivid more more wild and is that because you're like looking for a challenge uh like in terms of the process or is it just because you like the result better with those kinds of scenes hard to say i don't know a little bit of both yeah i guess i'm not thinking so much Uh, it's it's uh you can intellectualize afterwards but it's it's quite a backbone reaction you you, yeah in the moment it's just what you feel what you gravitate towards uh, what draws you naturally it's in the end at all in, in the backbone that tells you this here you should stop and make a shot right so a little bit like that but and then you of course you start to analyze and you sort of look at uh, how how things are interacting and yeah sometimes it's it's better than others and sometimes it's worse worse you know, so you know have yeah. you always been like so extinct instinctive where you just trust your gut when you're shooting and you don't overthink things or was there like a turning point in your photography where you discovered that that was better for you it always goes in steps i think uh, in the beginning I, I think i was more into drama like uh, high mountains and deep valleys in hallelujah light as i used to put it uh, whereas uh, nowadays i'm more into quite more quiet stuff and um more complex stuff i i think complexity is my uh my goal rather than uh than uh beauty or, or uh um i i i'm not really urging to impress either it's it's can be quite quiet stuff but i i um yeah, I like when I see something. Uh, I would love to have that shot by uh, Alex Oriego, that flower. That would have been great, great uh, part of my portfolio, but I don't have it. But, um, you know, yeah, can be small things that are, are um, interesting. Do you feel like complexity as opposed to like perfection is like a better representation of nature as well? Like how nature actually is rather than like those rare moments? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not into rare moments. You know, like uh, fantastic light. Uh, I've left that completely uh, because it's <clears throat> so much luck involved involved in that. And uh, yeah, I don't want to be a part of a lottery where I have to be lucky. You know, I I'd rather be uh, get what I deserve by being out there and and thinking a lot, trying to analyze, and then finding something bit by bit and eventually I take a picture I think more fair and more something that I can represent so you're more into like finding beauty in the mundane yeah yeah I would say so yeah that's that's the sense that I get from your work yeah I also just loved the the scenery here like all those ferns ferns are like one of my favorite plants ever and uh Tasmania is loaded with them and then the mossy trees it's just really nice and then the the leaf cover is really cool too on the ground really cool scene it's really really reminds me of something that we would find in the uh columbia river gorge area right mm-hmm. you know, really really similar to that and yeah love how you, you really put it together here hans it's it's uh it's great i, I just have to order another beer just hang on there <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh good man just a second i called my wife here you know <laughs> oh boy <laughs> oh, that's a classic i love it She's, in, uh, she's on another floor of the mansion. That's right. Can you come uh, bring bring a Fata Morgana beer from Only Polo? I don't. I've, I've had all the other the other two. So. <laughs> I think out of all of our guests, Hans has drank the most beer so far. By far, I love <laughs> he's, it. He's he's absolutely. We should have started with Hans. I mean, he's right. Just, yeah, <laughs> top of the list. Well, we had me practice. feel bad. Yeah. We're gonna get our shit together. <laughs> Among yes. friends, they call me the sponge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bob. I'm gonna have to say fuck it. It's 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 still in the morning here, but I'm gonna have to like uh, pick it up a notch to keep up with Hans. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you have plenty of hours to keep up, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'm it's, glad you. Can... Can... 
know, uh, yeah. I, I remember this was from a, an epic flight in 2013 over the Highlands in Iceland. And I remember, you know, there are moments when you look uh, through the viewfinder and you see this is just not, this is unreal, you know. And, and I remember when I saw this and I pushed the shutter, it's, it, in my head, it's a bing, you know, like, holy shit. Can it, <laughs> how can anything look like this? Uh, and it was a very, very strong uh, experience. Uh, you know, uh, how how is it possible that anything can look like this? And it's it's like a volcanic hills, uh, what they call rhyolite. It's a kind of mineral, and it's ash uh, that has been uh, concentrated on the top of the snow fields from, uh, I think, probably an eruption the year before or something. So, you know, when the, the snow is melting, all the, all the contamination is, is concentrated on, the, on top of the snow. So that's what you see in the ash here. And How uh, zoomed in were you on this one? Because I feel like, you know, it looks like an aerial view, but most aerial photography is a bit wider because people yeah. don't really think about like zooming in on stuff like this and shooting stuff without the, without the sky or it's still with a wide angle it's still with a 50 equal to 35 on the slr so you must have been pretty low not, yeah so uh, yeah i was just above this uh, very, very close not very high over these uh, mountain ridges and uh, yeah it was a fantastic flight i've never experienced anything like this uh, that happened in 2013 you would love uh, shooting a lot of the Badlands stuff that I photograph like here in Utah because it's really similar to this kind of landscape. Whenever I see this stuff, it reminds me of the Badlands here. Wow. It's like yeah. the Icelandic Badlands. When yeah, you uh, see my new book, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, the cover is just amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic yeah, cover. This, uh, so, I, so I actually was the one who chose this image, Hans, and, uh, you know, really the word you use is unreal, and that's exactly this, the first thing that popped into my head when I was scrolling through your website and saw this. This is absolutely an, just an unreal photo. You know, in so many ways, I think, I love the way the, the dimensionality is a little bit askew in this. Like, you, it's, it's a little bit difficult to appreciate just how deep those kind of I'll call them canyons. I don't, I don't really know the correct term for it, but like, you know, in between the hills and just how high it is, you, you don't really have that great sense of scale, which I think it, it works so well in this image to add to the kind of mystery and really kind of draw you in and make you spend some time uh, exploring it. And, and on top of that, it's just so well balanced, you know, for, for seemingly at first kind of glance, a chaotic image, it's really well balanced has a great flow to it so um just a really captivating image and um really happy to share this one and uh hear your uh your experience behind creating it now when i see it i would like to crop a little bit on the left side actually uh because uh i think cropping a little bit on the left would almost all the way to the the first that diagonal uh, line in the top left corner yeah just take a little bit of the left side and just crop that off, I think it would be even more balanced. I feel like that space on the left side, though, really counterbalances the right side. Like, if it got too tight on the left side, then it'd become pretty right heavy. Yeah, I agree. Not that we I know better to... than you do, but... Yeah, I th I'm thinking of the black uh, spot on top there. Mm. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. wait until you're sober again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey. Don't be don't be hacking this uh, <laughs> piece of art up, Hans. We we need yeah. you to settle down. This thing yeah. right here is a work of beauty. Yeah. No Photoshop till tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have. Uh, is that your uh, wife? Uh, it's coming in with uh, food supply. Nice. <laughs> Reinforcements. <laughs> savage. That is Absolute a first. Savage. That is a first on the show. Yeah, that is hand none delivered. of the none of the other men in the room here have that. <laughs> well, I I have a wife, but she's tending to four children right now. So if I told her to bring me something, she'd say, "Go fuck yourself." <laughs> I, I keep telling uh, Big Sexy here to go get me something, but he's not moving. Nah, he doesn't move too much. Man, that looks like orange juice. Okay, you know. Oh, freshly squeezed. What I have now is another Omnipolo. It's called Fata Morgana. 
it, it's uh, my kind of uh, standard uh, uh, drink IPA, 8.5%. Uh, uh, lovely. Uh, lovely stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Cheers. 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 Hey, I'm just going to say one thing real quick. Hans is hands down the best guest so far. I mean, this guy is <laughs> putting right. him away. Oh, no. He's he's putting him away. He's rocking he's, him back. He yeah. is outpacing the hosts. Yeah, <laughs> by far. You fucking Man. guys need to get hot. I mean, yeah. on. I I hit a wall with this one. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out. My I'm wife. Trying to stay coherent. That you don't have to feel sorry for my wife. She's drinking champagne right now. <laughs> She's doing oh, her own for her. views. There you That's go. right. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, this this image along with all your ice and stuff is just insane. You commented earlier, Hans, about one of the other images how it would be a really nice print, just the way it was it was flowing. I think this would be a really just phenomenal absolute killer large print. It would just be beautiful. Yeah, Hans has a special discount code for the Brews and Views staff. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Send, send like me it. a pack and I'll send you a print. All right. I love it. Another six pack on the stomach, but you know. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm going to the store after this. Yeah. DHL. I will load. You, I will load you up, Hans. Yeah, DHL. <laughs> with one of these uh, cheesecake, uh, blueberry, uh, mushroom. Uh, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> yeah, once you come out here, Hans, we'll take care of you. Uh, this yeah. is a care package ready. Yeah, this is a, a an aerial from Iceland, uh, shot in 2015, I think. Uh, over, uh, it's a huge delta on the south coast, uh, south coast of Iceland called Skeidarar Sandur, and uh, you can see how how Mother Earth is repeating herself into this uh, crazy pattern. You know, it's like a scale on a fish. Or yeah, or like sand dunes or flames. Yeah, but oh, it's, nice. it's like a it's like a vibration that has generated these patterns. So what is it? I mean, like, it was like or it a, could be like a really small scene in the sand, you know, like that sand yeah, stuff you shoot. Huge, right. Huge. We're talking five hundred meters, uh, half a mile. Or... Wow. I was going to ask you what the scale was. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, this is the one I I chose off your website, and I was just baffled by it um stare at a lot of sand but i've i've never seen anything quite like this so and this is uh water in between the the it's a black lava sand and then it's the silty water the white uh, uh water you know <laughs> yeah this isn't like a sand abstract jimmy this is uh aerial of uh yeah. the deltas it's river, you know it's a river pattern mm -hmm. it's crazy crazy it's to, to your point earlier, Hans, when you said when you're up in the air in Iceland, you can't believe it until you see it. This is exactly what you see. And your your aerial stuff in Iceland is what um, has taken me there uh, a number of times. It, it's it's total inspiring. I saw your stuff. I'm like, I have got to go uh, check that stuff out. And, and when you're up there, it is so surreal. It's it's amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, I show the the first book. I have it here. It, it's Iceland, but it's reversed. No, gosh. That's your very. That's your first Iceland book. Why is it reversed? When I I, see, I just reversed uh, on your that's screen. That's just your camera setting. We can see it normal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I think but, you're just drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. That's what three beers will do to you. Yeah. <laughs> three eight percenters. <laughs> yeah. Three eight percenters, and it's you know. It, now it's, it's backwards, uh, upside down. It goes from three uh, D to one uh, D. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, uh, yeah, you're anyway, in the shadow realm. This book was. <laughs> <laughs> this book was made by uh, a German guy called Klaus Franke, and. Uh, I bought this book in '95 when I visited Iceland, uh, Iceland the first time, and um, I looked through the book and I thought, 
There must be some technical mumbo jumbo behind this because it cannot possibly look like this. And uh, in uh, five years later, I went back to Iceland and went up in a plane by myself and saw that these patterns and these colors really exist. You know, all these reds, all these yellows, and all these patterns, they are real, they exist. Fantastic. And even when you see it, you can't believe it. No. And, I've been yeah. to Iceland uh, several times, but my poor ass couldn't afford any flights, so I just used my drone and I took like a bunch of images that I was really stoked on, and then I crashed the drone and lost all of them. So I don't have any. Oh, that sucks. Oh. We need um, to go back. We need to go back, Bennett. Yeah, we should yeah, do that. Let's I'm do it. down at some point. It's just like my I've been working on these book projects, and none of them include Iceland, especially not the next one because of Iceland's landscape geography but uh and i must say they, escape i must say they you they make really poor ipas as well <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, not you have you absolutely have to go with the stouts in iceland they've got a they've got a really good brewery that um uh -huh. because they, the ipas are terrible they are, they are there's a brewery in reykjavik that looks decent like a craft brewery i forget what it's called R a it's R rvc a or rv something there's an Einstuck. It's it's like a 5.4 uh, IPA. Nothing. I remember I drank like some Viking ale thing. Yeah. Last one was there. Uh, yeah, the Viking place um, does a really good stout. And you're right, Eric. There's there's a brewery in Reykjavik um, that has a really nice uh, hazy type IPA. That's that's pretty good. We we spent okay. some time there. We spent a week there one night. <laughs> That's a good one. They, uh, they barrel aged that in shark fermented. Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is so, great, Hans. This is really great. Um, I, I first went to, you've been photographing Iceland forever, and I first went to Iceland in 2014, and the entire country felt like a national park. And yeah, then when I, I went back in 2015, it was a little bit more crowded. Then I went the last time in 2018, and it was psycho. Like, traffic, you had to pay for parking everywhere. Every gas station, you had to, like, wait in line. I was like, oh, I feel so bad for the people that live here that had such a laid-back lifestyle. And now it's just, like, insanity 24-7 for all tourists. Like, what, what was it like shooting it in the 80s, and how has it changed? 80s? No, I, I was there first time in 95. Oh, okay, mm. I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, Mine was the, no tourists whatsoever. No, not at yeah, all. Yeah, I'm sure but, still. That's uh. But, but I, 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 I must say, if you just uh, skip the, the beaten track, you have no problem. You know, uh, if you go for the iconic places, of course you you have competition, so to speak. But. Uh, I have no problem when I go to Iceland. I I go into the inland and. There are not very many people around there, you know. When was the last time you went to Iceland? Uh, just this year in September and uh, okay. August as well. Yeah. I think I think I read Hans. You've been there thirty times. Forty four. Forty four. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's. I've been there that's three crazy. times. Forty four times. I mean, you have got to have like some just absolute intimate knowledge of the landscape there. That's. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, and uh, as I said, you don't have to confront all those tourists if you just skip those iconic places where you've seen, pic seen pictures from before. And uh, like you said, Eric, the whole country is like a national park, so you can almost stop anywhere and make great photographs. Yeah, well, you used to be able to like Crazy. camp anywhere too, but now it's like not allowed. Mm. I think yeah. you're... I I, I get that though, Hans, to your point, um, you're, it's changed a lot in the last decade, but, um, I think there's still a lot of, you, you get out far enough, yeah. and then you're, you're, there's separation from those tour bus that are yeah. dropping off, you know, 40, 50, 60 people at a time. Is Just, there anywhere that you still haven't been Hans in, in Iceland? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are areas in, in, in the interior. Where I haven't been. glacier inaccessible. What about have you? You haven't even flown over them. Yeah, I've flown over the most of it, but I haven't been by foot. Right. Uh, in the interior, yeah. 
and I haven't flown over uh, uh, the northwest, or the west fjords. I haven't flown there either. There are some. There is a very beautiful beach called Rödi Sander, uh, which is fantastic at low tide. There, I would like to fly there, but I haven't been there. I remember these guys uh, a few years back. They were like Chris Picard's friends. I don't think he was part of it, but uh, they tried to cross Iceland on foot, and the, it was called like the coldest crossing. And they have to. They had to give up after like day five, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Is it? laughs> Good try, but but it's not because like they weren't tough enough. Like it's just Iceland is just like incredibly inhospitable. Like in the interior, it just got like way too gnarly, and it was like a really rough winter. And like these, these were really tough, like rugged guys that had done lots of crazy stuff before. But it, the landscape was just punishing but, them day after day. Yeah, no soup for you. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's a problem the crossing in the summer like chris burkard you know he's been doing they tried that. in the winter yeah in the winter i can fully understand because that's that's too dangerous i think and with the blizzards and stuff but um but uh, in the summer I, I can you can easily if you have the stamina you can bicycle through, from the south to the north through the interior i'm sure i'm sure yeah, the winters. I, I was. I've done a winter trip, and it's it's. You hit a blizzard, it'll shut you down for days. I'm sure you've well, experienced the, wind there the same is fucking thing. Gnarly. Oh, yeah. you, the visibility is is feet. It's not yeah. like it's. You just absolutely cannot see. You cannot be in a car. You can't be like moving forward. You just have to shut it down. I'm sure you've experienced that, Hans. Mm. Yeah. I was there like in late October one year and it was like winter conditions because it was like a, a pretty bad snowstorm and like it was just like that like you could only see like a couple feet in front of you and we got mm -hmm. to a point where like I was scared to even drive the car because I wasn't sure if I was going off the road or staying on the road couldn't tell the difference because <laughs> the, the landscape exactly. was flat. Yeah. Yep. But uh, all of a sudden there was like this arctic fox that like ran out in front of the car. And then he just started cruising and every time I would like stop, it would stop and like turn around until we kept going. And it was like showing us the way dude. it was like this, this really surreal, like magical moment. Like it was just wide out and this little white, like Arctic Fox is just like showing us the way. That That's is awesome. so cool. And he just left when we got That's to the so place cool. that we needed to go. Like we were trying to get to this trailhead and as soon as we got um, there, he just took off. That's so cool. That's crazy. I've experienced the same thing though, where you just cannot, you're literally going a couple miles an hour and you're like, am I going to run off the cliff? Am I going to run into a snowbank? What is it going to be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No depth perception. It, absolutely. Yep. It's, it's yeah, there's no horizon. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Get that every Definitely. once in a while in the winter, um, coming off Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, just the, that lake effect stuff. You just, you cannot see more than a couple feet in front of you. You don't know. Yeah. It, everything is bad. Going. Yeah. Another one from oh. Iceland. Well, here oh. is. Uh, yeah. What the fuck? It, it, it's no, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is um, uh, a shot from, uh, from uh, one of the rivers on the south coast. And uh, there are two, uh, I think, the Glocious Gulls or some, some bigger gulls flying together across this abstract delta and it gives a scale to it, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. you, you don't have a clue what the size is, but here you right. get a it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yep. That's when I, when I was looking through your portfolio, Hans, it's, I mean, it's, it's really hard to like pick an image of yours to show. Um, but you just nailed it. When I, when I saw this one, I saw the goals. I was like, um, it really gives you a sense of scale. I mean, the background, the backdrop is absolutely phenomenal, but um, this is super unique. You don't you don't see that a lot with um, you know you you do see a few of these shots uh, floating around, but uh, really uh, cool how you got the goals in this shot. I love it. And uh, right. that is just luck, of course. Uh, I mean, you have like like we say, you have to be there and. Now and then you're lucky, and this time I was lucky to be there when there were two birds flying across. And um, but it, it happens more often if you if you fly over the rivers on the south coast in in the spring. This was shot in March, 
Uh, there are a lot of uh, activities uh, among birds in, in, the, in the early spring, March, April, when, when the gulls are uh, mating. And uh, you can see uh, big congregations of birds uh, over the river deltas. It can be uh, mm. insane. Hans, do you have a... So when I, when I went, I mean, I've been, um, I've been in the fall and I've been in the winter several times. Um, for flights like these, do you have a favorite time of year that you like um, to uh, Spring get Spring is probably the best because of runoff for like early summer. Yeah, and more water in the early, early um, part of the year, like in the spring. But that so like, or do you get like less structure because it's like too full, like too high? That's what I was thinking. It's it difficult question to answer, depending on what you want to shoot. Uh, but uh, this river, you know, it's it changes a lot. You know, uh, this is shot in March, uh, and I've shot mm-hmm. it in all kind of seasons and. Uh, it always looks the same. It always look different, and the patterns and the colors and everything it changes. So you can't really, I can't say really. Sometimes it's very red, and here it's kind of more yellow. And um, mm. yeah, what's really cool about this one though is you have those bare sections where there's no water that give it that nice veiny tree-like structure. Mm-hmm. Right. You would lose that if the water was too high. I think. Hans, do you have a uh, do you have a pilot that you specifically like when you go there and, and make these flights? Yeah. Yes and no. But I have I've had a lot of pilots, so I would say. Uh, He's like, yeah, but yeah. I'm not sharing it with you. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, when I went, um, I. I found a I found a pilot that I really liked and and he was very like hey you know what whatever you guys want to do you know you have the headset on you know you tell me when you want to bank which way you want to go who was um, that Paul because that'd be good uh, publicity for him yeah he um I'll I'll pull it up here while we're sitting here talking about it but it was it's a little airstrip um that's down just north of. Uh, the lagoon area. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up and, and figure out exactly who it is. So, so he kind of down near the Keflavik Airport. No, no, it's it's way south. Oh, the Iceberg Lagoon, the Jokel Star. Yes. Lagoon? Okay. Yes. I thought you meant like the Blue Lagoon. No, um, and they and they were great. I mean, he was he was a really young guy. I would I would venture to say he was in his late teens or early twenties, but uh, <laughs> literally, literally, um, he and, had a permit, not a license. Yeah, I was like, I thought he was fueling up the plane. And uh, he said, hey, this is your guy. I showed him a couple of images of things that we wanted to do, like on the beaches. As far as, yeah, just kind of the area we wanted to shoot. <laughs> and then and then maybe some stuff up in the highlands. And uh, he's like, yeah, I got you. Put on the headset and uh, just just work with me and, and we'll get it done. But uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, good to have a pilot. But um, you know, this um, famous guy Hadi died. You know, uh, I don't know. That, yeah, Diego Volcano, Volcano yeah. pilot. That's what I was wondering. I, I didn't know if he was your guy or not. I really didn't want to ask, but but I, but I know. I don't think I Hans ever flew with him. I asked Hans when he died. Never flew with him. No. Yeah. But but I, I have another guy. His name is Gudmundur. Uh, he has his own plane, but but I need to find his f- phone number. I I can send it to you, Eric. You can, you can send it over to the other guys. Um, Maybe I will. I, I have. I yeah, he will. In exchange for some beer. Uh, <laughs> next package is free, and I'll send you the okay. phone number. Yeah, I, I, I had a I had a fantastic pilot. His pilot, his name was Ar- and uh, this was shot with him. And uh, eventually, I threw up in his plane, and he never flew with me again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and not for, not from uh, India Pale Ales. It's from um, air sickness. So. <laughs> Has that happened before, or was it just that one time? Uh, it happened one time, but uh, it was extremely uh, turbulent, and um, yeah, it. it I, I felt bad immediately after takeoff, and. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and he had to almost do an emergency landing with if landed on, on some grass field just to get me out of the plane and and I had a guy from Reykjavik coming and picking me up with a with a car it was just horrible but um he never flew with me again but he was a fantastic pilot we got a lot of good shots with him I, he doesn't he's not living in Iceland anymore he's away somewhere I haven't I haven't seen him for eight years so <laughs> there is a guy his name is Gudmundur he has a plane. He's a lovely pilot as well. He's doing the job perfectly with the Cessna. Cessna, yeah. Well, that, that yeah, other guy sounds like a dick. I throw up in my bathroom all the time. My wife still talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my pilot was uh, out of uh, IcelandAdventures.com, and uh, he had a Cessna as well. And it was great that I've done a couple of different flights where you have to shoot you have to end up shooting through glass or plexiglass or something like that, which really, I mean, you can, Fuck you can that. really get some, you can get some yeah. glare. Um, you got to wear a certain glove. So it doesn't well, the resolution show like that, that glass isn't as quality as like the glass of your lens, like absolutely and everything. It's yeah. going to make it soft. Yep. So their, their planes had, um, had cutouts, uh, in the front and both sides in the back. So my son was in the front. I was in the back, had cutouts on both sides. I flipped both those down. And uh, yeah, really, really great experience. Really, really great company and great cool. pilot. So I had, had really, really great service through them. That was uh, cool. kind of big Cessna, right? Uh, a big one. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'll flow with that. It's from uh, uh, the airport just south of the top of that, right? Yeah, it was just it was just south of like the um, the big glacier. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly the one, Hans. There was still an airfield there. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. That works. I've flown with him. That works very well. Yeah, and it's and and really the place where you're going to be shooting is just minutes from that airport. So you once you're in the air, you're you're ten minutes yep. away from where you're going to do most of your shooting. Yeah, both uh, huge delta, Skadar Sounder, and you have the glaciers and everything just nearby. Yeah, perfect. Yep. How long yep. was the flight, Paul? Like an hour? Um, I initially booked it. This is I, I didn't know how much time I would need. I initially booked it for forty five minutes, um, but when I got there, I changed it to an hour and a half. And uh, so you were flying, and it's forty five minutes. He's like, "We're going back." And you're like, "Fuck no!" And you slipped him like a hundred dollar bill or something, like stuck in his shirt. Or... <laughs> Well, I talked to him. Waistband. Yeah, exactly. I tucked it into I tucked it into his shorts. Said, "Hey, dude, let's go more." No, um, when when, uh, when I got to the uh, the uh, airport there, I was talking to the uh, lady, and uh, I told her I wanted to shoot up to the Highlands as well. And she said, "Well, if you want to go up to the Highlands, um, let's add another forty five minutes to that." And uh, I'm so glad I did because when you go up to the highlands, that's where you get a lot of those cones, and uh, uh, depending on the time of year, you kind of get that really green cone type stuff, or or the or the snow and ice ones, and and the um, the the braided type rivers that kind of lead up to those. So I mean, yeah, yeah there's just really some crazy. amazing stuff. Sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, hour hour and a half was was good. But I mean, it's it's never enough, right, Hans? I mean, you're just you could just stay up there for hours and just keep shooting. Yeah, uh, sometimes flown for five hours. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's too much. I'd be fatigued. I don't even know that, how to compose after that. That is a matter of having a big bladder. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Got but, but also, uh, I flew. Uh, uh, this year in, in uh, June, I flew uh, with a client with a helicopter. Uh, um, uh, or, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, Robinson uh, 66, you know. It, it's a small one with a turbo uh, turbojet uh, engine. And it, it can fly for five hours. Uh, it's, it's quite an amazing helicopter. And uh, with the doors off, and I can tell you, I was freezing. Freezing. I was like a fish finger. I, I was in pain, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was quite a horrible experience. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> I, I just try, tried to figure out how to survive because my client, he was sitting next to the pilot in the front and he was quite well wind protected, whereas I was in, in the severe wind uh, in the back seat with the door off. And and uh, the the wind came up through the through the pants, you know, and uh, under the jacket. And uh, God, it was freaking cold, you know. <laughs> you so you literally froze your balls off. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I had to cut. Them off. <laughs> <laughs> Dissectomy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My frost I, wanted to, I wanted to throw this one in because you have like so much epic aerial stuff and like crazy Highland Iceland stuff and everything that people know you for. But uh, ever since I first saw this image, it's always stuck in my mind because it's so simple and it, it's just like understated, but it's so miraculously like, I don't know. It, it, there's something about this one that to me is so remarkable just the 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 lines in the sand and then the streaking water it's just like the perfect moment and to me this like epitomizes your your photography in a way yeah thanks uh yeah it was it's one uh, of your newer ones too so yeah it was quite um special experience uh i'm standing in um like a what is it like uh four inches deep water uh, not more than that, hmm. like like this deep water with, with rubber boots and uh it's incoming tide and and uh i had this uh in my mind before i went to uh to lufoten uh it was shot was it this year in uh could be could it said 2023 in, yeah it's in in uh january late january and and um i this is a tilt and shift adapter for the Hasselblad uh, for the H system that I used to use. And then I, I put a adapter to the new Hasselblad camera, the X1D. So it becomes a really huge uh, thing. First you have this uh, uh, tilt and shift adapter and the 28 millimeter lens. And then I have the adapter from X camera to H system camera, so it fills up like this, and then you have a camera like this. So a huge fucking uh, uh, device in front of the camera, but I could tilt the lens and get perfect depth of field, uh, just uh, finding a perfect tilt angle, and I could shoot everything in one frame, because you can't really uh, uh, fo uh, focus stack uh, when water is moving like this. I, I shot several shots with this kind of device. Uh, very clumsy, but uh, it, it is doing the job. And, and I was very happy with this shot, really, because it, it's uh, water coming in, wave is coming in, and it's very strong water, and you have the sand ripples underneath. So you had kind of visualized this beforehand? Because that, that's something I was thinking, like, how could you anticipate this kind of scene? Yeah, it's in because, your book. That's what I was looking for. It's called Incoming Tide, Lofoten, Norway, 2023. Because I've been there several times. That's why, yeah. Huh. I've, I've been there seeing this happening, and I haven't had the right gear to, to shoot it. So I, I brought this one along just for this job. Yeah, this one to me is just like such a it's like very ordinary it's just water on sand but the way you captured it and the scene itself is like so extraordinary that's why i really re admire it because it's like there's very little to work with but you did it in the best way possible thanks and i like how it's like intimate but it's like wide angle you have like a lot of stuff that's kind of like wide angle but like below the horizon which is mm. something i don't really think about i'm usually shooting like 70 millimeters or more when i'm doing intimate work i tend to shoot like uh, 35 equal to 35 yeah that's crazy that's really wide for me those lines are great and the uh cool moving towards the light just really frames this up yeah. this up very nice yeah it's like uh i feel like you have this ability to make something 
out of nothing but without like cheap tricks or like you know crazy editing or adding shit like you just like uh focus on the raw most basic elements and make something compelling with them somehow well that's all of them crazy fantastic wow. really cool what stuff a, what a set i mean the stuff that oh, hans brought in was, was fantastic and and the stuff yeah. we featured what a show hans and only oh, God, really see. good oh. yeah, yeah best way to spend a saturday morning for sure <laughs> afternoon no question <laughs> no question how do you end the day now you, you guys because you put a great uh how to say great start to the day with all these uh mixed, uh enjoyment and what, I, mean, I, I guess say, i'll have to keep drinking <laughs> yeah, yeah what i what i say Hans, stop now yeah hans what i always say is it's not day drinking unless you start in the morning yeah yeah, yeah. can't drink all day unless you start in the morning Amen. that's right yeah and mikey uh didn't even go to sleep he just kept drinking for this one what so, are you serious much. i'm on a bender now <laughs> <laughs> it's like we were together the first time night. like Jesus. yeah we were <laughs> I'm not I'm not super into wine and I don't like hard liquor at all, but I feel like wine is the one other thing besides beer that I could get into. But it, I feel like it's so expensive. Like the roof, there's like no ceiling for pricing on wine. You know, not you can get all. like hundred year old stuff for thousands of dollars. You can get superior in the Pele's for a ten dollars. That's right. the roof, right? Yeah, that's and, the thing. Like, like IPAs yeah, don't even get that expensive, and they're like the best you can get. Then, then you have the top of the line, but with wine, it's like I said, it's it, it can be There's no just, cap. Yeah, because no. there's no aging beer. You don't really age beers, really per se. Not like you would just stouts, but not more than a few years. All right? Like, yeah, not not like a you know bottle <laughs> from like 1880 or something like that. Exactly. Like, I feel like it would just lose everything. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, I think yeah. now that you've got that smoker fired up, Eric, you yeah. mix in some uh, some uh, cabs or some uh, red blends, you'll be like, okay, I get it. Yeah, with the with the meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Pairing. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send you over something. You just pair that up with a nice steak. You're like, okay, I get it. But okay, I mean, you, you don't have to spend a fortune to have good wines. You can have gorgeous wine for. Um, let's say $25, $30, yep. Yep. superb wine. And, and mm -hmm. uh, above that, it's um, it's a lot about branding, you know. It's yeah. a lot about, you know, branding. It's not related to, you, you can't say that uh, $1,000 wine is better than $100 wine. It's, yeah, it's not 10 times better. No, 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 not at all. It might not even be better, you know. Right. It's just more like the experience, like knowing that you're drinking something that nobody else will ever get to drink because like, <laughs> it, it, you it's rule. Like a lot of context. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I've, I've been, uh, how to say, um, a passionate wine drinker for uh, 40 years and um, I, I'm getting more and more basic um, because I, I think it's so much branding and bullshit and uh you know you end up popping a very exp expensive cork and it doesn't it's like a status symbol match with your your uh how do you, your uh expectations yeah so yeah but, i think it's a great point as you refine your palate you can find better wines at lower lower price points you, you're better able yeah. to kind of pick through you know what's available there well, I've heard like point. in taste testings, like table wines that are like 10, 15 bucks, uh, people thought tasted better than like 50 year old aged wines and stuff. Right. Mm. For sure. For sure. There's a lot of that going on. Like 20, 25 bucks is like the sweet spot. Uh, yeah. Kind of like stouts. You, yep. You, yep. You just said it. You know, I think 25, 20, 25, 30 bucks, there you can find as good wines as you. You can get almost, and, and I would say if you really want to have good wines without spending too much money, I I think you should go for Rioja, you know, in Spain, 
uh, the, those wines are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. wines, they are just crazy good, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good with meat, with a steak or with with game meat or or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I spend so much on beer already. I'm not looking for another thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. on. Yeah, still working on that resolution. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trying to cut back. Yeah. yeah. You can buy less beer so you can buy more wine. <laughs> but with your beer, if you have like a, a stash of those, or I mean, they, they, they have a short lifespan. Yeah. Since I mainly get IPAs, um, they're. Uh, they're Dude, Hans was asking you some pretty good questions, and you were like really. What were you saying, Hans? Ignoring him. Now it's too late. This uh, wine, uh, this stash of uh, of uh, beer looks like you. It's like a national park to me. <laughs> yeah, the best beers in the nation in this region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it really is. Yeah. That's the Death Valley yes. to uh, inside there. That, 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 so yeah. I got the stats right here, the barrel aged stuff. Some other things. Got the can stats here, IPAs here, some yeah. sours up here, and some loggers. Korea Canyon to the left. Yeah, that's my little, <laughs> yeah. my little corner of happiness. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Looks awesome. I feel responsible for all that stuff. Yeah. Or, or you, you're the one who introduced him. No, he's the one who ships it. He ships it. You're the pusher, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm the pusher. Exactly. Yeah. He's he's the dealer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we had a uh, an un an unusual coincidence that I work right next to his favorite brewery. And I it was like a couple kilometers away and I didn't even know it for several years. Yeah, so I'm responsible for for that, because I introduced him to the best brewery in the nation right next to where he works. Yeah. <laughs> and so now I'm, uh, yeah, just remortgaging the house and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mikey, okay. why are you wearing my shirt, dude? Because didn't you say we we're all going to wear a brew or uh, brew host five and shirt? Well, that's Paul fine. obviously missed that. Oh, yeah. Jimmy's got it. Nice. Yeah. Like, we're all wearing it. I, I, I gave mine away. I'm drinking a beer out of a huge wine glass because uh, I, I think it's a great experience to inhale the aromas of, of a good beer as well. Yeah, uh, I agree. When, uh, say if you have a, a glass that doesn't really concentrate the, 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 the aromas, you get nothing on the nose. And like good wine, there is a lot of experience also through the nose when you have good beers amen definitely the, the aroma is a huge part yeah. of it um, i was working with the stout for sure mm. okay well, cool what's uh what's next for you? you going anywhere going on any trips soon or anything or just hanging out at the house i don't know really i have nothing i i was supposed to have a workshop uh, with trim and um it, it won't happen you know but uh i don't know what's gonna happen really uh in the near future um i have nothing really planned for it I, i'm going to actually there is a big event in in uh, the emirates in, uh, uh, in sharia it's called Shar sharia or sharia or whatever uh, next to uh dubai is like sand dunes it, it, no it's a big uh photography event called exposure with with the uh, x Posture. You can look that up on the internet. It's a huge event there. Uh, so I have an exhibition there with 25 big prints in the end of um, February. That's cool. Nice. Yeah. We'll see if that works out well, hopefully. And that, oh, those that's are, great. Those are all aerials from, from Spain that I shot this year. So nice. Shut up. <laughs> the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Animal abuse. He's, no, he wants to be. He wants to be fed. It's a little bit past his uh, feeding Polar time. Feeding. Yeah, two of them. Only one of them is a pain in the ass, though. Just a. Do you have any pets, Hans? You got a cat or a dog or something? 
Unfortunately, I'm allergic, but I love dogs and cats. Uh, I'm especially allergic to cats, but I love them. And I, I love dogs. Uh, I'm less allergic to dogs, but I, I feel myself that I'm a dog, you know. I, yeah. Uh, gosh, uh, dogs are phenomenal. The other dog's getting jealous now. Oh, yeah, they're going to start humping each other in a second. You'll see. <laughs> it's going to show. <laughs> It's gonna it's gonna transition to uh, yeah. uh, rated R. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll blow up the algorithm. <laughs> uh, me and you, me and you, still got to plan our workshop over here in the U.S. Hans, we. Uh... Yeah, we, you probably know, some book out one over to, but I, I need to talk. Publisher and have one sent to me, but I'll, I'll sort it out. Um, I, it's on my uh, on my menu. So my yeah, that'd be awesome to get that book. I'll send you one of mine as soon as I <laughs> here we get go. All in stock. <laughs> yeah. Out. Your dogs are going crazy. Yeah, they're, they're a little hungry. Sorry. Yeah. That wood floor. Mm, yeah, I can't. get have zero traction on it. It's hysterical. All right, Hans. Cheers. Well, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hans. Yeah, Love having you finally. Nice yeah, meeting you. Absolute pleasure, right, Hans. To, nice uh, meeting you. Happy New Year. Thanks for being our yeah. first guest of 2024, first episode of 2024. Yeah. And, uh, and by far the best drinker. Hope to see you guys again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks so a lot, Hans. Come back on uh, as a guest host. You're definitely welcome. Yeah, that'd be super cool. Yeah, it'd be so much fun. Yeah. Holy Christ. Cheers. Happy New Year to you. Happy yeah. New Year. Happy Cheers, New Year. Hans. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone.